But I've never taken the time to explain how the countries of my homeland of the United Kingdom, England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland actually got their names. Now I know what you're thinking, did I actually call the areas of the United Kingdom countries? Well, yes I did. I know it's not as clear cut as that, but the United Kingdom is an awkward silly country full of awkward silly people. So for convenience sake I'm calling them countries, but there is much more to it than that. My friend Soliloquy made an interesting video on the subject, go check it out. First off, let's look at the most northern country of the United Kingdom, Scotland. The name Scotland comes from the Latin word for the Gaels, the Scotty. So where did this name of Scotty come from? Well, there is no clear answer, but there are a few theories. One theory holds that the Scotty name comes from the Gaelic, uh, that, that word, meaning horde or crowd. Another idea is that it comes from the Gaelic skewit, meaning cut off, yet the idea I like the most has its roots in legend and mythology with the story of the Greek prince Gaphilos. He was banished along with his wife Scota. They sailed westward, eventually landing in Spain. From here they explored further, with his son Hilba founding an island, which is now Ireland, and naming it after his mother Scota, calling it Scotia, a name that eventually shifted to the people of the Scoti, and eventually the name of Scotland. And below Scotland we have the land where I live, England. England, much like Scotland, is named after the people who lived in that area. England's name comes from the term the land of the Angles, which was then translated into England in Old English. So if England is named the land of the Angles, then who were the Angles? And how'd they get their names? The Angles were a Saxon tribe that occupied modern England during the early Middle Ages. It's believed the tribe sailed from an area which is now the Bay of Kiel, which is now a part of modern Germany. The Bay of Kiel, however, was originally believed to be called the Anglan Peninsula, which is what the people were named after. So England is a place named after a people named after a place. Ireland is an interesting name as it's the geographical name for the island as a whole, but also has a presence in the names of the countries on the island of Ireland, the Republic of Ireland or just Ireland, and Northern Ireland, which is part of the UK and the one we're interested in today. Of course, Northern is a derivation of North, adding an EN to make the noun into an adjective, and North itself comes from the Proto-Germanic Nurfa. So how did the name Ireland come to be? The name for Ireland comes from its name in Irish, Ira, which comes from the old Irish name, Iru. This is also the name of a Gaelic goddess who is believed to be the matron goddess of the island of Ireland. So the country is named after her. And just as we are getting into the groove of the countries of the UK being called something land, we have Wales to wonderfully throw a spanner in the mix. One of the more prominent theories on how the name Wales came to be is is it coming from the Proto-Germanic word Walha, believed to mean things like stranger and foreigner. This is a name given to Wales from Anglo-Saxon origins as opposed from the Welsh language itself, hence why the name refers to the Welsh as foreigners. In the Welsh language, Wales is called Cymli, which means companion or fellow countryman. So it could be determined that this native name is a much nicer name to call the country. So a while back here on the channel we looked into where the name of Canada came from. So while we already know the origins of this nation's name, today we're going to be digging a little deeper into the names within this country. Canada is a country split into 10 provinces and 3 territories. All of course have names, from names as well known to people as the name of Canada itself like Quebec and Ontario, to more curious sounding names like Prince Edward Island, to pretty obvious to understand names like Northwest Territories. What's also interesting is how while Canada is a country of two official languages, English and French. The name for a lot of these provinces and territories come from a different tongue, that tongue being the languages of the native people of Canada. So let's look at how these provinces and territories of Canada got their names. So let's start the names of the provinces of Canada that have names that derive from the native peoples of Canada. First is the most populated province in Canada, home to its largest city, Toronto, and the country's capital, Ottawa. This is of course the province of Ontario. The province of Ontario is named after Lake Ontario. This name comes from the Iroquois language word Canada and it's thought to mean things such as beautiful lake, great lake or sparkling water. So yeah, Lake Ontario's name can be translated as Lake Great Lake. Next to Ontario we have the province of Quebec. This is a name of Algonquin origin. Like Ontario, its name also relates to water as it's thought to mean a narrow passage or strait, relating to how the St. Lawrence River would start to narrow where the city of Quebec would stand. Two names of provinces of Canada come from the Cree language, those being Manitoba and Saskatchewan. With Manitoba we have another province named 
after a lake. That of course being Lake Manitoba. It's believed Manitoba comes from the Cree term man into Wapawa, which means the narrows of the Great Spirit, due to how it narrows more in the center. Saskatchewan is too Cree and named after a body of water, though a river this time, not a lake. It's believed to mean swift flowing river. The Yukon Territory is too named after a river, the Yukon River, which resides in not only Canada but makes its way into Alaska too. It's thought this name comes from the lower Tanana word, Yukuna, which means a big river. The most northern territory of Canada is Nunavut, which not only includes a huge part of mainland Canada, but also many of the islands in northern Canada and more or less borders Greenland. The name comes from the Inuit language Inuttutut and means our land, so residents of Nunavut might say Nunavut is our land and you're having none of it. Seeing as we just talked about two of the territories of Canada, we might as well explain the name of the third territory now. <clears throat> the Northwest Territory is called this as it's in the Northwest of Canada. So aside from indigenous names, the key source we have for names of Canadian provinces come from the tea-sipping, forever moaning, name-explaining British. You're welcome. Some of these names, however, might not seem that British at first glance, like with Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Nova Scotia is actually Latin and means New Scotland, which is something we discussed all the way back in the New United Kingdom video, named by Sir William Alexander when he received the land in 1621. William was a Scotsman, so named this land as the new version of his home. Brunswick is a name that sounds suspiciously German, and that's because it's the anglicised name of the German town of Braunschweig. So why does this province in Canada with a German name have the British to thank for this? Well, when it was founded, it was named in honour of King George III, who also held the title Duke of Brunswick. New Brunswick, of course, isn't the only province to be named in honour of British royalty. Canada was part of the British Empire, remember, and the Empire just loved naming things after the royal family. There's Alberta too, which was named after Queen Victoria's fourth daughter, Princess Louise Caroline Alberta, and of course Prince Edward Island, named unsurprisingly after Prince Edward. British Columbia was already known somewhat as just Columbia, but the British part was added by Queen Victoria when it became a colony in 1859. The Columbia part of the name comes from the Columbia River, which wasn't named after Christopher Columbus but rather the ship, the Columbia Reda Viva. Finally, we have the one province with two names, Labrador and Newfoundland. These names differ from the rest as they are of Portuguese origin. The name Newfoundland should be pretty easy to interpret. When it was discovered, it was some new found land. Labrador, however, comes from the surface name of Portuguese explorer João Fernandes Labrador, which over time became just Labrador. But of course, the most important thing about all this is that these two names were used as names of two dog breeds, those of course being the Newfoundland and the Labrador, both of which are very good boys indeed. Can you believe that I've been making name explained for over three years and I haven't even looked at the etymology of France? I live in the southeast coast of England, I can pretty much see the country from my window. And of course France is a spectacular country with a deep and amazing history full of interesting characters. And it's the most visited country in the world. People flock to the nation to see its amazing cities, mountains, beaches, ski resorts. France has it all. So to make up for this lack of acknowledging France for all these years, let's make up for it by not only looking into how France got its name, but how the nation's many regions ended up with their names two. So, first off, let's look into how France itself got its name. France is actually a name that I covered in my book, The Origin of Names, Words and Everything in Between, which is now available from Amazon, hint hint. Like many countries, France is believed to be named after the people who live there, the people in this case being the Franks, a Germanic people who took over the land. France's Latin name is Francia, which means the country of the Franks. How the Franks got their name, however, is a bit more confusing. The popular idea is that the Franks got their names from a specific type of weapon they were known for using, a throwing axe called a Francisca. However, more recent evidence points to the weapon being named after the people and not vice versa. It's more believed now that the Franks are named after the old English Franca, which means free, as the Franks lived tax-free after they conquered Gaul. This etymology also makes the term to be frank make much more sense, as when you say to be frank, it means you are speaking freely. So, that's how France got its name, but this video is about way more than just France. It's about looking deeper into the regions of France too. France is currently split into 12 regions on its mainland and an island just off its coast in the Mediterranean. France does have overseas territories, but it's just these 13 we'll be looking into today. However, this has only very recently become the case. There used to be 22 regions on mainland France, but since the 1st of January 2016, these 22 regions were merged into just 12. Some gaining completely new names, some kept their own names, and others were given names completely compiled from their previous names. 
Like I said, it's these new regions we will be focusing on, but I will say what the previous regions were called and look into a few interesting ones with names that might ring a bell and a big apology for pronunciation going forward. I can barely say English words, let alone French words. Hopefully, if future Patrick remembers to do so, my pronunciation sources will be in the description down below. The northernmost region of France is Bordeaux Flans, which is made up of the former regions of Nord-Pas-de-Calais and Picardy. This name means Upper France, which makes sense considering that this region is the furthest northern point in France. Normandy is a region of France that didn't change massively in 2016. It simply combined Upper and Lower Normandy together. This name comes from the people who settled in the land, mainly Danish and Norwegian Vikings. They were known as the Northmen slash Norsemen as they came from the north and over time this became the Norman and their land became Normandy. Ile de France is the most populated region in France and that's due to it containing the country's capital, Paris. Due to this, the region is also known as Religion Parisienne, which means Paris region. Of course, that isn't its actual name. Ile de France means Island of France, which is weird considering the region is completely landlocked. This name apparently derives from the fact that the region is bordered by rivers, what surrounds it somewhat like an island. Glondes is a pretty obvious name for us to understand. It's pretty big and grand and is located in the east of France. Originally, it was made up of the regions of Alsace, champagne aladin and Lorraine. It's that region of champagne aladin that sticks out to me, however, especially the former part of its name, Champagne, which in itself is a historic region of France. The sparkling wine drunk around the world is named after this region. Brittany wasn't affected by the changing of the French regions in 2016. This name sounds so similar to the island nearby due to it being named after the Britons who settled on the land. I covered this in detail in my Names of Celtic Britain video. Just below and next to Brittany is Pierre de la Loire, which like Brittany wasn't broken up or changed in the French region reformation of 2016. The first part of this name means country of the in French, with the Loire being the longest river in France and the river that goes straight through this region. The name for this river is thought to come from the Latin in Liga, which is thought to come from the older Proto-Indo-European route for words like mud and water. The Loire River's name appears once more in the region next to Père de la Loire, Centre Val de Loire, which simply means that the region is in the centre of the Loire Valley. This region too was not changed in any way in 2016. Below the Grand Est region, we have the region of Bourgogne Franche Comte, its name being a combination of the regions that formed it, Burgundy and Franche Comte. Burgundy is an interesting name, I find, and not only is it the name of a previous French region, it's also the name of a dark reddish purple colour. Like Champagne, we have alcohol to thank for this, as the name for the colour Burgundy comes from the dark red Burgundy wine produced in Burgundy. And of course, it's the surname of the finest journalist our world has been blessed with. The region of Nouvelle Aquitaine was formed of the regions of Limousin, Proton Chanot, and Aquitaine. It's from this last region where the name comes from, as Nouvelle Aquitaine means New Aquitaine. This name is thought to come from the Latin Aquitania, meaning waterland, as its western border is next to the Bay of Biscay. What struck me as interesting here is the previous Limousin region. A type of hood worn by the people in this region reminded people of a profile of a certain long fancy car, so those cars became known as Limousin. Limousines. Olverne von Alp's name too quite simply comes from the regions that created it, Olverne and Ron Alp. The name Olverne comes from Averni, a Celtic tribe who once lived in the land. The Ron Alp name comes from two geographic features, the Ron River and Alps mountain range. The region of Occitanie is made up of the former regions of Landoc Rossion and Midi Pilani. Instead of just combining these names together, the name of Occitanie was used. This name comes from the historic region of Occitania, which resided in the south of France. The last mainland region seems to have two names its long name of Provence Alpes Côte d'Azur and its shorter name of Région de Sud. This latter name is easier to understand, meaning simply the south region due to its location. This longer name comes from a combination of factors it would seem. The region shares a lot of its borders with the previous French province of Provence. It's by the Alps and contains the Côte d'Azur. This last name I find particularly beautiful. It means coast of Azur and comes from the beautiful azur coloured oceans that grace it. Finally, we have the island of Corsica, an island region in the heart of the Mediterranean and a birthplace of a certain emperor. Unfortunately, we don't seem to know where this name comes from. It comes from the Greek Corsis, but after that we are clueless. 
We have looked into the land of clogs and stroopwafel in the past, where we tried to figure out why the residents of this nation are called Dutch and why the country is also known as Holland. Spoilers for that video. While the whole country is called the Netherlands, two of their provinces are called Holland, North and South Holland specifically. The popularity of these two provinces has led to many people calling the whole country Holland. Of course, however, North and South Holland are only two of the 12 provinces that make up the country of the Netherlands. So how did all 12 of these provinces of the Netherlands get their names? So let's start off with the common name in the Netherlands two most popular provinces, Holland. A popular folk etymology for this name is that it means the hollow lands, referencing how low the region is to sea level. But that's not thought to be true as logical as it might seem. The name actually comes from the old Dutch hotland, meaning woodland, due to the woods and forests in this land. Of course, the reason one province is called North Holland and one is called South Holland is due to one being in the north and one being in the south. Despite one of these regions being called North Holland, it isn't actually the most northern region in the country. That title belongs to Groningen. By the way, I should probably mention now all my pronunciation sources will be in the description below this video. It's believed that this name comes from the name of just one person, someone by the name of Hlono. A tribe of people would have felt that this Hlono fellow would have been their ancient leader and founder of the tribe. So the tribe named themselves after Hlono, and in turn the land they resided in became named after them. To the west of this province we have Friesland. This name has its origins due to once being part of the larger ancient region of Frisia. This region actually has two official languages, Dutch and West Frisian. The Friesland name is its Dutch spelling, while in West Frisian, the province goes by the name of Friesland. So to understand this name, we need to look into where the name of the ancient region of Frisia came from. It seems we aren't too sure as to where this ancient name comes from, however. It's apparently from Latin, but beyond that, things are murky. One idea I read that I enjoyed was that it comes from the Germanic Fris, meaning curly, which we still see today with terms like frizzy hair. Perhaps the people of this land had seriously curly hair. East of Friesland, we have Drenthe. This name is thought to come from the number three. You can even kind of see the Dutch word for free in its name. This apparently relates to how in the past this region was split into three lands, so this name is thought to mean the free lands. Below Friesland and Drenthe, we have Flivoland. This name has Latin origins. When the Romans came to the land, they discovered a river which they named Flevum. As they went on, they found this river widened into a lake which they named Flevolacus, meaning the lake at the Flevum. So this region is named after a lake which was named after a river. Perhaps the most alien looking name to English speakers is the name of the province of Ofeisel. However, once you discover its etymology, it's actually a pretty logical one, even to non-Dutch speakers like myself. In the Netherlands, there is a river called the Eisel, and this province is past it, across the Eisel, or in other terms, over the Eisel. See what I mean that it's pretty easy to understand? The province of Gelderland has an etymology unlike anything I've seen before. First off, its name doesn't actually come from anywhere in the Netherlands, but rather the nearby German town of Gelderden. Now, what's interesting is that this town of Gelderden is associated very strongly with the legend of a dragon in the town. Supposedly, when the dragon in this town was slain, it let out a cry of Gah! and it was this death rattle of the dragon that the town, and then the Dutch province, was named after. The province of Utrecht is named after the province's capital city, Utrecht. This city was set up as a place to cross the Rhine River, and its Latin name unsurprisingly means a place to cross the Rhine River, and over time the name was shortened to just Utrecht. The southernmost province of the Netherlands is Limburg. Like with Helderland's name, this name comes from a town outside of the Netherlands, this time being the Belgian town of Limburg. The Berg part of this name means fortification, as we see in a lot of place names. The latter part of the name, however, is thought to derive from a Germanic root, meaning lime tree. Though I'm guessing this relates to the Tilia tree, which is also known as a lime tree, but doesn't actually produce lime fruits. What's odd is that one of the Netherlands' most southern points has North in its name, North Brabant. There was once a South Brabant, or just Brabant, in Belgium. It makes sense from an etymological standpoint for these two Brabants to be in different countries, as the name comes from Old High German, meaning newly broken lands. Finally, we have Zeeland, the least populated region of the Netherlands, which consists of many islands and waterways. This water location is emphasised in its name, as in Dutch, this simply means sea land. It's a place so nice that it got a whole new version too. We have the Romans to thank for the name Germany, in fact none other than the most famous Roman himself, Julius Caesar. In one of his writings he spoke of a tribal people he called the Germani, people the Roman had come into contact with who resided in modern day Germany. And because of these people the Romans dubbed their land Germania, which transformed into the name Germany we have today. 
though it wasn't just the Germani people who lived in this land. All kinds of different tribes of people lived in the lands that would become Germany, and all these tribes had different names. Because of this, different outsiders gave the land different names depending on what Germanic tribe they first met or had to deal with most. In example, the French dealt a lot with the Alemanni tribe, so to them the country became Alemange. Meanwhile, Finnic speakers in Finland and Estonia interacted more with the Saxon tribes, so they named the land Saxa after them. While all these other people were given their land a name, the actual people of the land thought of themselves as just people, so named the land after their word for of the people, which was Feudisk, which eventually evolved into the German name for Germany, Deutschland. Now, while this video isn't really about how the nation as a whole got a selection of its many names, I feel it's only right to start with this, as the many names of Germany kind of explains to us just how important the various regions of Germany are. Germany really is a country built on its regions. For the longest time in history, there was no nation called Germany, but just a collection of Germanic states that shared very little in common other than languages that all sounded somewhat similar. And it stayed this way all the way up until the 18th of January 1871, where after a war with the French, the various Germanic states were unified simply into the single nation of Germany. This was all done under the guidance of Otto von Bismarck, a statesman who went on to become the first Chancellor of Germany, and luckily enough was an incredibly German looking man himself. What a coincidence. Because for so long Germany was little more than an ununified series of states, many of these states built strong images for themselves, and are perhaps just as well known as the nation as a whole. A name like Bavaria conjures up a strong image in one's mind of greenery, castles and beer, whereas Berlin conjures up an image of modern history and a much more modern design. At least for me it does anyway. And Bavaria and Berlin are both states of Germany, except you may have noticed that one is a huge area of land and one is just a single city. This is because the states of Germany really do vary in size like this, which you will see as we look into them. And Germany has an incredibly rich history, in that many states have disappeared, or have only come into existence in the last 30 years or so. I really don't think there are many countries that have changed their borders as much as Germany has. Just look at maps of Germany throughout history. Today however we are looking into the here and now, and today Germany comprises of 16 states, so it's these 16 names we'll be looking into, and as for their names, it's their English names we'll be checking out. Whilst, as we mentioned, the country itself has really different names in English and German, the names of its states aren't as different. On the whole, they aren't completely different names with different meanings for the states between languages, it's just that in their English names, words we have in English are spelt in English. I'm rambling now. This will make more sense as we go along. And let's start up in the north of Germany with the state of Schleswig-Holstein. This state, as mentioned, is the most northern point of Germany and its northernmost border is Denmark's southernmost border. Because of how close the land is to Denmark, there have been wars and arguments over which country owns the land, and it has even belonged to both countries. Because of this, there is a very mixed population of Germans and Danes living in this land. It is also nicknamed the land between two seas, as to its east is the Baltic Sea, and to its west is the East Sea, which saying out loud is pretty weird, but we live on a globe, one person's east is another's west. The name of this state is of course from joining up the two historic states of Schleswig and Holstein. The name at Schleswig comes from the Schlei, an inlet from the Baltic Sea in this land, and the Wig slash Wig suffix means bay in Old Norse, so the name means the Bay of the Schlei. The Holstein part of the name is believed to come from a tribe of people who lived here called the Holkate, which is believed to mean dwellers in the wood. To the east of this, we have Mecklenburg West Pomerania, which is known as Mecklenburg Vorpommern in German. This state seems to take pride in their natural landscapes, almost 2,000 kilometers of coastline along the Baltic Sea, and the picturesque ancient towns that look like they have come out of fairy tales. The current Chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, has a constituency in this state. Like with the previous state, this state's name derives from merging the historic regions of Mecklenburg and West Pomerania. The region of Mecklenburg was named after a castle that once stood here called Mecklenburg Castle, and it's believed this name means in Saxon a big castle, so despite the fact this castle no longer stands, we can presume it would have been pretty big. And of course, West Pomerania comes from the fact that it was the western part of the former region of Pomerania, with Pomerania being a region that runs across the Baltic Sea, in what is now Germany and Poland. Because part of Pomerania was Polish, the name comes from the Polish Pomozi, meaning by the sea, as it's by the Baltic Sea. And yes, a certain species of dog has this region to thank for its name. As I mentioned, some of these states are simply just cities, and the city of Hamburg is one of them. Hamburg is the second largest city in all of Germany. It's also huge 
huge. Just as many people live in the greater Hamburg area as they do in the entire country of Norway. And Hamburg's harbour is almost as big as Copenhagen. It's a huge maritime industrial city that has a state unto itself. With Hamburg, you'll once again see the Berg suffix, which means castle. But the hand part is thought to possibly mean bend slash angle, as the city was built on a bend of a river. And of course, a certain kind of food has this city to thank for its name too. The smallest of all of Germany's states is called Blumen. It's actually split between two separate land areas, both within another region we'll talk about next. Not only is Bremen the smallest state, but it's also the least populated in Germany, consisting of just the city of Bremen and Bremenhaven. The city's name is thought to come from the Saxon Blem or Blimo, which means edge or brim, as the city was built on the edge slash brim of the river Visa. As mentioned, the state of Bremen is completely engulfed in another state, with that state being Lower Saxony, which in German is called Niedersachsen. Lower Saxony is Germany's second largest state in size. It seems this state is really well known for their horses, so much so there's a horse on their flag and coat of arms. The Saxony part of this name comes from the name of the Saxon Germanic tribe, who yes, along the Germanic Angles helped form the Anglo-Saxons, who inhabited the island of Britain. Saxon is thought to come from the German Saxa, meaning warriors with knives, coming from the old Norse sax meaning knife slash sword slash dagger. Now, this of course also explains to us how the region of just Saxony got its name, which is more in the south of Germany. Though, this brings up the question of why there is somewhere called Lower Saxony that is more northern than the state of just Saxony. Well, the lower in Lower Saxony doesn't relate to cardinal directions, but more elevation. Just Saxony contains some of the Alps, and of course the Alps are rather high, so the Saxons who didn't live in the Alps were lower down, hence why they are Lower Saxony, despite being more northern. The name of Saxony also appears in the name of the region of Saxony on Holt too, which is east of Lower Saxony. We know all about the Saxony part now, so what about the Unholt part? It seems the Unholt part originates from a ruined castle called Unholt Castle, though from where the name of this castle comes from we don't seem to know. In the east of Germany we have the state of Brandenburg, and if you're anything like myself, you may be shocked to hear that Brandenburg is more than just a big fancy gate. While the state may be home to the city of Potsdam, one third of the region is protected land with mountains, tree-lined roads and lakes. We have the Berg part once again meaning castle, and I read the Brandon part means burn, so the name means burnt castle, which is pretty cool but why this castle is burning however I couldn't find out. And within the state of Brandenburg we have the state of Berlin, which like Hamburg and Bremen is the single city that is also a whole state. And of course Berlin is the capital of Germany, is a city steeped in a huge amount of history as one of my personal favourite cities in the world. Seriously, go to Berlin. As for where the name comes from, we have a few ideas. Berlin is a city heavily associated with bears, there's even a bear on their flag, and the name was thought to come from the name of these animals, coming from the German bar, meaning bear. But this is now considered something of a folk etymology. Today, it's thought to come from Slavic sources, meaning things like swamp or marshy place, as the city was initially founded on low marshy swamp land. In the west of Germany, we have the state of North Rhine-Westphalia. This is Germany's most populated state and includes many of the nation's well-known cities, including Cologne, Düsseldorf, and Dortmund. This state was formed in 1946 from the previous provinces of Westphalia and just the northern part of the Rhine province. The name Westphalia comes from West as it's in the West, and Falia comes from a Germanic term meaning flat slash level, so the name means West Flatlands. Germany also has an East Falia, but that name doesn't seem to be used too much in any modern sense. The North Rhine part comes of course from the Rhine River in West Germany, with this river's name coming from ancient root meaning to flow. In Central Germany we have the state of Hesse. It seems that the name for this state is much like Saxony, in the fact it is named after settlers of the land, the Hessian tribe, though I was unable to find out where their name came from. Though interestingly for those with knowledge of the American Revolution, the word Hessian may ring a bell, as the German troops hired by the British to help them in the revolution were also known as the Hessians. And much like with Hesse, the state of Fluingia is too named after the Germanic people who settled there, the Fluingi, though we aren't too sure how those people got their name either. South of here we have the states of Rhineland Palatinate, the Rhine part we covered earlier with the Rhine River, but what about the Palatinate part of the name? Well, this has more to do with wine than the Rhine, as it's one of Germany's largest wine grown regions. In German, Palatinate is called Flatz, and this means palace slash high official residence. Saarland is a tiny nook of a state in the southwest of the country. It's the smallest state apart from the aforementioned city state, and its capital somewhat shares its name, being called Saarbrücken. The region is named after the Saar 
river which runs through not just Germany but France too. Baden-Württemberg is Germany's third largest state and it came into creation in 1952 when the three smaller states of Württemberg-Baden, Baden and württemberg Hohenzollern merged together. We've had places named after people, castles and rivers, but it seems the Württemberg part of the name comes from a hill with the same name in the state's capital of Stuttgart, while the Baden part comes from the name of the spa town of Baden in the region, and Baden simply means bathing, kind of like how here in England we have a spa town called Bath. And finally we have Germany's largest and perhaps most well known state, minus the cities, Bavaria. The word conjures up the classic German image of lederhosen, beers and beautiful scenery. Though what about that name? Well once again we have a group of people to thank for it, this time the Celtic boy people, which turned into the Latin boyalia and eventually into Bavaria. So whether you are drinking beers in Bavaria or eating hamburgers in, well, Hamburg, now you have a better idea as to how the states of this wonderful nation got their names. Japan is an island nation, in fact according to Wikipedia it's the fourth largest island nation by area and the second largest by population. However Japan isn't just one massive island in the middle of the sea, Japan is actually an archipelago of many islands. In fact there are 6,852 islands that make up Japan as a whole. So we won't be covering all 6,852 of these islands, but just the main ones that make up Japan. Japan is primarily split over four main islands and a series of smaller islands in the south. However, as well as being split geographically by islands, Japan is split up in a more man-made fashion too, being split into eight regions. Now, three of these regions are just the islands as a whole, so the islands and regions share a name. However, Japan's biggest central island is split into five regions. So today, let's look into how the islands and regions of Japan's got their name. And also, as an added bonus, let's look into how a city in each region got its name too. First off we have Japan's most northern island, Hokkaido, which as I mentioned is also a region unto itself. This is Japan's second largest island too, and from what I could read it has a very northern feel to it, full of mountains and ski resorts and natural beauty in general. Hokkaido's name is very much tied into its history. The island slash region is seen as Japan's least developed area, and it wasn't until the 1800s that people from the rest of Japan started to inhabit and settle there. Before this the island was called Ezo and meant land of barbarians as it was so untamed. However, as it became more inhabited and built up with the settlements and roads, the name Hokkaido was given to the island, and this name means North Sea Road slash Circuit, as roads were built on this island in the Northern Sea of Japan. Hokkaido's most populated city is Sapporo, perhaps most well known for the beer that shares its name that originated from the city. It seems that the name of this city comes from the Ainu language of the Ainu people who are native to this part of Japan. It apparently means dry great river in reference to the Toyohiro river. We will come back to the island below Hokkaido in a moment, but for now let's look at the island slash region of Shikoku. Shikoku is the smallest of the four main islands of Japan and from what I read it is a very Buddhist centric island. The island is home to an ancient pilgrimage in which you can walk the island and visit 88 Buddhist temples. In the past this island was split into four regions slash provinces. These four historic regions were Ara, Tosa, Ayo and Sunuki, and it's because of this why the island is called Shikoku, as the name Shikoku means four regions. Shikoku's largest city is Matsuyama, home to a beautiful old Japanese castle and some of Japan's oldest hot springs. The name this city apparently means Pine Mountain. I imagine this is because the island and the city surroundings are very scenic and would have contained mountains and pine trees. Very close to Shikoku is the island slash region of Jushu, which is the southernmost main island of Japan. Jushu is the third largest slash second smallest main island of Japan, depending on your outlook on life, and has something of a subtropical climate including many hot springs and volcanoes. In fact, because of these volcanoes, the island is also known as the Land of Fire. The name of this island is actually somewhat similar to Shikoku's. This island was once split into nine ancient provinces, and the name of this island derives from Japan's word for number 9, Zhu, with the Shu part of the name coming from the Japanese word for provinces, Shu. The island of Jushu is home to the city of Nagasaki, a port city with many sights to behold that became well known for a very unfortunate reason. The name Nagasaki means a long cape. Now I don't think this relates to the kind of capes that superheroes wear, but more the geographical kind of capes. This kind of cape is defined as a very large piece of land sticking out into the sea, and from looking at a map of Nagasaki and the general area, calling it a long cape seems to very much fit the bill. 
South of the four main islands of Japan lie the Ryukyu Islands, which is a large stretch of islands that in turn are broken into smaller groups of islands that stretch from Japan's southernmost tip all the way to Taiwan. I couldn't find too much on this name, though apparently it came from Chinese and means a glazed horn dragon, though why it means this I'm not too sure. The biggest of these islands is called Okinawa, and this and the aforementioned island of Jushu are seen as a region of Japan. On the island of Okinawa is the city of Naha. This city supposedly has a very odd naming origin story. The name apparently comes from the word Naba, which was the name for a large mushroom shaped stone in this city that eroded over time, and Naba over time became Naha. It's rather odd and so far I think this is the first city to be named after a stone that I've covered. And I've saved the biggest for last, that being the island of Honshu. This is of course a huge central island in Japan. Not only is it Japan's biggest island, but it's the seventh largest island in the world. The majority of the Japanese population live on this island, and the majority of the classically Japanese things are on this island too, from Mount Fuji to many of Japan's popular cities. If you're visiting Japan, you'll most likely spend a lot of your time on Honshu Island. Though as interesting as Honshu is, its name isn't as interesting. As I stated, Honshu is very much the main island of Japan, and its name means exactly that, main island slash main province. We even see Shu again, meaning province, like we saw the island of Jushu. As Honshu is so big and populated, it means that unlike the rest of the islands that are standalone regions, Honshu is split into five regions, the most northern of these regions being Tohoku. It seems like the island north of it, Tohoku too can get rather chilly in the winter months, though I've read it's full of history and natural beauty. The name Tohoku simply means northeast region, as well by some surprises in the northeast of the island of Honshu. The largest city in the region is called Sendai, and while I could find out it has the nickname of the city of trees due to the many trees in the city, I couldn't find out what the name itself meant. I found out that the kanji character of this name apparently translate to mean hermit and stand, so I'll let you figure out what that means. And below Tohoku you will find Japan's most populated region, home to about one third of all the Japanese population this being the region of Kanto, which yes is a name that will sound similar to a lot of you. Kanto contains Japan's capital of Tokyo, so I'm sure you see why it is so populated. Outside of Tokyo however, Kanto can be a very rural region. I read that the name Kanto means east of the border slash barrier, and to explain this name properly, we have to bring in another region of Japan, Kansai, which is also known as Kinki, but YouTube may demonetize us if we use that name. The name Kansai means west of the border slash barrier. These two regions of Kanto and Kansai have a deep intertwined history, primarily because Kanto is home to Tokyo and Kansai is home to Kyoto. Kyoto was the former capital of Japan, but it was moved to Tokyo. This in the past led to quite the split between these two regions, hence why they both thought they were the ends of the land and gained these names, though I imagine that this feud isn't quite as heated these days. Now, as for cities in Kanto and Kansai, as I mentioned, they are home to Japan's two most well-known cities, Tokyo and Kyoto. Kyoto, so you may think I'd explain their names, however I covered their names and their history in way more detail in a video unto itself, so go check that out. Instead, for Kanto I'd like to cover Yokohama, and for Kansai I'd like to cover Osaka. Just outside of Tokyo, Yokohama is Japan's second largest city. The name means horizontal beach, and relates to the river and the sandbars that used to be there, and made the river look like a horizontal beach. Osaka in Kansai is too a huge, colourful city. The name means large slash big hill, though the city is actually rather flat. This name probably refers to the nearby hills and nature. Though between Kanto and Kansai we have the region of Shubu. This region contains perhaps Japan's most well known landmark, which can be seen even from Tokyo, Mount Fuji. This region is very central in Japan, so not very creatively the name simply means it's central region slash central part. While not the biggest city in the region, I'm going to cover the name of Takayama in the region, as I've been there myself and it's a lovely city. This name apparently means high mountains, which makes all the sense in the world as the city is surrounded by high mountains. And finally, at the western tip of Honshu Island, we have the Shugoku region. This region may have the most confusing name of all the regions of Japan, as Shugoku means central country. Now, I understand why Shubu had a name like this, as it is in the centre of Honshu. However, Shugoku is about as far away from the centre of Honshu as it gets, so why it has this name, I'm not too sure. Perhaps it has something to do with the past and previous tribes of people living in the land. To them, this may have been the central area of their land. 
but to modern ears that name really doesn't work out. The region of Chugoku is home to the city of Hiroshima, which like Nagasaki is famous for a very sad reason too. Like with the name Chugoku, Hiroshima is a bit of an odd name too, as it means wide island, and the city of Hiroshima is not an island, though Hiroshima is also the name for the wider area around the city too, and this wider area does include many islands, some of which are rather wide I imagine, which most likely explains to us where the name comes from. And that just about wraps things up here. In the past we've looked into the name of Japan and its native name of Nihon slash Nippon, why it's known as the land of the rising sun, and even why Tokyo and Kyoto have similar names. Now we understand how its main islands, its regions, and some of its most popular cities got their names too. It'd be easy to say we are done with Japan, however these regions and islands of Japan actually break down into 47 different prefectures, each with their own name. I guess they can be saved for another time. When we talk about the nation of Italy, we have a habit of focusing on just the nation's ancient capital, and of course, the empire that rose from it. We have talked about why the nation isn't named after the Romans, but Romania is, and the myth behind the naming of the city. And of course, the language that's popularised by Rome, Latin, is constantly brought up in videos, due to its effect on so many other languages today. But there is way more to the modern nation of Italy than just this city of emperors and gladiators. The nation as a whole is over 300,000 kilometres square in size, meaning it's is way bigger than the likes of New Zealand, the UK and the Netherlands, so it's pretty darn big. And like with pretty much all nations on our planet, it's broken up into areas, with those areas being called regions. Italy is made up of 20 regions, and each of these have their own image, culture, cities and of course names. Some of these regions are small areas of land, while others are entire islands. So today, like we've done with the likes of Germany, France and the Netherlands, let's look into how the regions of Italy got their names. Though, why don't we have a quick refresh? fresh on where the name Italy itself comes from too. Well despite all the things Italy is known for, I don't think cows are one of them, yet yeah, that is what the country is thought to be named after. It's believed to come from the Oscan language, an extinct language from southern Italy, name of Vitliu, which was a name only applied to the southern tip of the peninsula. This name was thought to come from the Vitali tribe who lived there, and their name is thought to come from the Latin Vitalus, meaning calf. And some even think the name Italy simply means a land of cattle. So despite everything that's happened in this land that it could be named after, it is most likely named after baby cows. Anyway, onto the regions. In the northwest corner of the nation, we have the Auster Valley, which is the smallest region of Italy in not only size but population too. This area of land was seized by the Roman Empire in around 25 BC. Leading the empire at this time was none other than Emperor Augustus, as he was responsible for leading the Roman Empire to claiming this land. The area was named after him, so that is why this name translates into meaning the Valley of Augustus. The next region is known as Trentino South Tirol. The Trentino part of this name comes from the largest city here, Trento. This name means three teeth, which is a reference to the three hills that surround the city, nothing to do with a teething baby. The South Tirol part of this name is of course a reference to the fact that it makes up the southern part of the historic region of Tirol, with the rest of Tirol now being in Austria, which makes things a bit more clear as to why Italy's most northern regions has South in its name. Back over in the northwest we have the region of Piedmont, and the region is heavily surrounded by the Alps that makes its way across a huge part of Europe. It's because of its location next to the Alps as to why it has this name, as it comes from the Latin Piedmontus, meaning at the foot of the mountains. And funnily enough, this isn't the only Piedmont on our planet, as the plateau region of the United States of America has this exact name too. To the east we have Lombardy, which is the most populated region in the entirety of Italy, home around 10 million of the nation's 60 million. The name of Lombardy is thought to have come from the Lombards, a Germanic tribe of people who ruled a huge amount of Italy, from 568 AD to 774 AD. Their former capital of Pavia is still within the region of Lombardy to this day. But if Lombardy was named after the Lombards, then how did they get their name? Well there seems to be a few ideas as to how this name came about, but the most popular of them is that that comes from two Proto-Germanic words, which come together to mean Longbeard. So I imagine those initial Lombards who came down from Northern Europe to claim Italy must have had rather long beards, long enough to be named after them at least. 
Next up we have Veneto, a region that is best known for one city in particular, Venice. And as Venice once had its own republic, it seems this region has its own unique identity when compared to the other parts of the nation, including its own language of Venetian as well as Italian. The name of this region most likely comes from the city of Venice, and the city's name is thought to come from the ancient Venetian people, but where their name comes from remains a mystery. And in the northeast of the nation we have the region of Friulia Venezia Giulia. This region seems somewhat removed from the rest of Italy, and it is shown in the languages spoken here too, as German and Slovene are spoken here due to Austria and Slovenia being close by. They also have their own language of Friulian too, which is a Romance language originating from here. It seems that the Friuli part of this name means Forum Giuli in honour of a forum built here by the Romans, while the Venezia part once again references the nearby Venice and their former republic, and the Giulia part honours the Gens Giulia patriarchal family of Rome. Members of this family include the likes of Gaius Julius Caesar and Emperor Augustus. The Ligulia region is crescent shaped and shares a border with France and the aptly named Ligurian Sea. Its name seems to be of pretty ancient unknown origins. It seems to be named after a tribal people who lived here, the Ligurs, but where their name comes from seems to be unknown. Some think it may come from the name of the longest river in France, the Loire, but we just aren't too sure. Unfortunately this is one of the side effects of talking about a part of the world with such ancient history. As we finally start to enter the boot of Italy as it is known as, we have the region of Emilia Romagna. This region houses the famous city of Bologna, which lent its name to a source and a breed of dog that originated from it. While the former part of this name is now a popular feminine name, it actually derives from the name of a road, Via Emilia, which was named after Roman consul Marcus Emilius Lepidus and goes through this region. The latter half of this name, as I'm sure you can see, simply derives from the Roman Empire. To the south we have the region of Tuscany, a famed region of Italy known for the city of Florence, and is widely considered as the birthplace of the Italian Renaissance. It is perhaps the best known region of Italy outside of Rome. The name of Tuscany comes from the name of the Etruscan people, the main civilization on the peninsula before the rise of Rome. However, like we've already seen in this video, where exactly the name of the Etruscans came from we aren't too sure. One theory thinks the name relates to water due to the amount of rivers in the region of Tuscany. Somewhere in the centre of the entire nation is the region of Umbria. This region once again is named after the ancient people who lived here, the Umbli, and as to where their name came from we have a few ideas. Pliny the Elder thought that in ancient times they were called the Umbli, which comes from Greek and means the people of the thunderstorm, which is a pretty cool meaning. It is also from this region that a new reddish brown pigment was found and used in paintings, and this pigment slash colour is fittingly named after the region, with it being called Umber. East of Umbria we have a which shares its border with the microstate of San Marino, which is entirely surrounded by Italy. Funnily enough, this name is actually a plural of the term Marc, which is a name applied to any kind of borderland, as in the past this land featured multiple Marche, including the Marc of Fano, Mark of Camerino and Mark of Ancona, so this name was applied to it, even though it's a single entity now. And next up we have the region of Latio, where Italy's capital of Rome resides. There are two ways in which we explain the name of this area. One of those are a mythological tale, in which the land was named after the Latini people who were named after their King Latinus. However, the more realistic etymology is that it comes from the Latin word Latus, meaning flat and wide, in relation to how flat the land in this area is. And yes, if you didn't realise it's from this region as to where we get the word Latin itself from. Let's take a quick detour from mainland Italy and delve into the nation's island regions. Off the coast of Lazio lies the island of Sardinia. This is the second largest island in the Mediterranean and yes, it's thought that the fish are named after this island and not the other way around. It would be way too easy if the island was named after the fish. We aren't sure where Sardinia comes from. Some believe it evolved from the Greek name of the island Sardo, while others believe it came from the pre-Roman name of the island Sard. Either way, we don't seem to have any idea as to where these two old words came from anyway. However, what is of interest is how we got the term of sardonic from Sardinia. To be sardonic means to be humorously cynical or mocking, and the Greeks believed that eating a specific flower from the island of Sardinia made people pull a face that they were laughing in a cruel and well sardonic way. And while Sardinia may be the second largest island in the Mediterranean, first place goes to Italy's other island region, Sicily. And surprise surprise, Sicily is named after the Sicil people who lived on the island. However, of course, as to where their name came from, once again, we don't seem to know. I'm always annoyed when I can't give you guys clear answers, but unfortunately, sometimes we just don't know. Let's head back to the boot of Italy now, and look into the region to the east of Lazio, Abruzzo. This region is one of the greenest in Europe, and a huge amount of it was made in 
into a national park to protect wildlife and nature. This name comes from an evolution of an older name for the region, a Prutium. This word however is thought to come from a combination of the name of a tribe and the name of one of their leaders. As we venture into the angle of Italy, we arrive in Molise, which only became a region unto itself in 1963. Before this, it was just a part of the aforementioned Abruzzo region. I wasn't really able to find too much info on how this name came to be. One idea I found is that it may come from the Latin word for mill, mola. Perhaps there were slash are many mills in this region. South of Molise lies Campania. This region contains many of Italy's most historic sites, like the remains of Pompeii and of course Mount Vesuvius. This name comes from Roman origins. They called it Campania Felix, and this name has been translated into meaning in English either fertile countryside or happy countryside. Whichever one you choose to translate it as, it's clear that the Romans enjoyed this land, enough to create so many sites here and give it such a positive name. And as we enter Italy's here, we have met with the region of Apulia, which in Italian has the slightly different name of Apulia. This name once again comes from a tribe called the Lapuds, and unfortunately their name is of unknown origin too. I'm sounding a bit like a broken record now, aren't I? At the arch of Italy's foot is the region of Basilicata. This name comes from a rather unique origin. It comes from a title given to rulers, with that title being Basileus, which was a title given to rulers of the Byzantine Empire, aka the Eastern Roman Empire. Why the title for rulers of the Eastern Empire ended up as a name of somewhere in the West, however, we aren't too sure. And finally, on the toes of Italy, we have Calabria. There's two ideas as to where this name comes from. One of them is that it comes from the Greek words meaning beautiful and vegetation, or that it comes from Latin root meaning land of mountains. Whichever one is correct, the name clearly celebrates the beautiful nature found in this region of Italy. many many times how exactly the nation of the United Kingdom works. It's split over two main land masses, the island of Great Britain and part of the island of Ireland. And across these two land masses, the United Kingdom splits into four smaller nations, England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. However, things can of course break down even further as these four home nations split, like many countries, into counties. It's the counties of just one of these nations we will be looking into today. Those being the counties of the biggest and most populated home nation of the United Kingdom, my home nation of England. England is made up of 48 counties, by some counts anyway, and each seems to have its own cultural identity and image, and their names are perhaps one of England's biggest export. The names of these counties pop up all over languages, in the names of certain foods like the Cornish pasty and Cumberland sausage, to breeds of dog like the Staffordshire Bull Terrier, and of course these names are used as names in other parts of the world, like the US state of New Hampshire. Even if you aren't from England and have never been here, it's likely many of these names will ring a bell in your brain. These counties also vary from huge expanses of land to just singular cities in their greater areas. So today, let's look into how the counties of England got their names, and hopefully one day in the future we can look into the counties of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland too. However, just to make things clear, what counties am I covering exactly? As I said, I aim to tackle 48 counties, but by some counts there are more and less. It's because these county borders differ depending on circumstances and many other things. I'm focusing on the ceremonial counties, which were formalised in 1997, as these are the traditional counties of England most people have heard of. Day to day though, many of these counties are split into smaller patches, like how Devon is the ceremonial county, but in reality it's governed as three counties, Devon, Plymouth and Torbay. It's a minor detail, but I know some of you in the comments will want to point it out. And speaking of Devon, let's start just west of that county, in the deep southwest of England, with Cornwall. This county has a very strong unique identity, even with their own language, and the name is thought to come from that language, with the name of a tribe that once lived here, the Cornovi. This name is thought to mean horn people, due to Cornwall's horn-like shape. And as mentioned, we have Devon to Cornwall's east, known for its beach beaches and Dartmoor. The name is too thought to come from the Celtic natives, the Dumoni, whose name is thought to relate to the deep valleys of Devon. Northeast of Devon we have Somerset, a place best known for its cider and the village of Cheddar, which yes the cheese is named after. The name sounds like the season of summer for a good reason, as it comes from Old English and means the people who live at Somerton, with Somerton being a settlement there. This settlement's name is thought to mean summer settlement, hence why it relates to the season. The city of Bristol and its surroundings 
surrounding towns is actually a county unto itself. Bristol is a famous city, known for being the birthplace of Blackbeard, Clifton Suspension Bridge, Skins, and Ardman Animation. The name does actually relate to bridges, thought to mean the meeting place by the bridge, in relation to the many bridges across the River Avon. Going back south, however, southeast of Devon, we have Dorset, another seaside county. It's the pebbles of one of its beaches as to where the name is thought to possibly come from. It may be from Britonic and mean place with fist-sized pebbles, which are very big pebbles indeed. And it's from here that we run into a word forming element you're going to be sick of by the end of this video, Shire. For my calculations, 24 of these 48 county names end with Shire. That's half of them. In fact, sometimes the counties of England are known as the Shires of England. And it's a word that inspired Tolkien to name the realm of the hobbits the Shire. This is an old English term and simply means things like province slash stewardship slash district. So it's no surprise to see it pop up so much. A lot of the time, the part that precedes Shire in these county names relates to a major settlement in that county. So apologies if I get a little repetitive with these. The first Shire we come across is a Wiltshire, the home of Stonehenge. Wiltshire is named after the town of Wilton in the county, which in turn comes from the River Wiley that goes through the county. Then we have Berkshire, which the internet tells me is known for sheep, which simply means hilly place. And below Berkshire, we have Hampshire, home of the historic cities of Southampton and Portsmouth. And the Hamp in Hampshire comes from the Hamp in Southampton, with Hampton popping up often in England and means a water meadow. Moving away from Shires for a moment, we have the Isle of Wight, England's only entirely island-based county. There's a few ideas as to where this name comes from, but the most popular theory is that it relates to lifting slash raising, as the island is raised out of the sea. And east of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, back onto the mainland, we have Sussex, which is actually split into the two counties of East and West Sussex. East Sussex is the famous city of Brighton, and West Sussex has, well, me. This name relates to Britain's ancient residents of the Saxons, who came from northern Germany slash Denmark. It simply means a land of the South Saxons. And there used to be a land of West Saxons too with Wessex. And we still have a land of East Saxons, which we'll cover in a moment. And further southeast in England, we have Kent, famous for Dover and its white cliffs. As this is the part of England closest to Europe, it has a name of Roman slash Greek roots, though it's thought to ultimately derive from an old British Celtic word, meaning coastal district due to its location. Moving west of Kent, we have Surrey. Potheads will know this county as the likely home of the fictional Little Whingen, where Harry Potter himself lives. Surrey simply means a southerly district, as it's south of the most famous place in the UK, London. And as for London, it's split into two counties. The city of London is its ancient core, and Greater London and its surrounding boroughs like Croydon in the south and Enfield in the north. We don't know where exactly the name London comes from, but there's a range of ideas while being named after an ancient king called Lud, to it come from ancient Celtic words meaning wide flowing river in relation to the Thames. As for why one of these counties has a city of attached to it and why the other has greater attached to it, I'm sure you can figure out. And as mentioned, we have the land of the East Saxons, that is with Essex. UK TV fans will know this county for Gavin and Stacey, and the reality show which states that Essex is in fact the only way. This isn't the case, however, as west of Essex, we come back to the Shires with Hertfordshire. This county is named after the settlement of Hertford, with this name meaning crossing for deer. A hart is an old name for a stag, and a ford is a part of a river low enough to cross. And as for Buckinghamshire, this too comes from the town of Buckingham. With this town's name we have Ham, like in Hampton meaning water meadow, and the former part is thought to come from an ancient landowner called Booker. And yes, it was the Duke of Buckingham who the Queen's primary dig was named in honour of. Oxfordshire, the county, is once again named after the city of Oxford, most known for its university of course, and this is a pretty easy one to figure out, especially as we've already covered Hartford. If Hartford was a ford slash crossing for heart slash deer, then it should come as no surprise that Oxford is a ford slash crossing for oxen. The Gloucester in Gloucestershire comes from a town yet again, and it's thought to mean bright place, though what was so bright about it I'm not too sure. But some think this bright relates to bright in the clever sense of the word, not in the well-lit sense, and just north of here on the Welsh border,
border is Herefordshire, named after the town of Hereford. We have yet another crossing, but for Hera, a Hera is an old term for formation of soldiers, so the name means soldier crossing. We're still carrying on with shires, with Worcestershire, most famous for their sauce and its tricky pronunciation. Once again, it's named after a town, that being Worcester, which is believed to come from a name of a tribe who once lived there. Like Oxford, Warwickshire is too well known for its highly regarded university in the town of Warwick, with Warwick meaning dwelling by the weir, with a weir being a small man-made dam in a river. And then we have Northamptonshire, once again we have Hampton, which means water meadow. So here we have a North than water meadow, which went on to be the name of a city, which went on to be the name of a county. Bedfordshire is named after the market town of Bedford, which once again relates to a ford crossing and possibly an old Saxon sheaf of this land called a bidder, not an actual crossing for actual beds I'm afraid. And Cambridgeshire to its east is named after Cambridge, which is too known for its university. The bridge in Cambridge relates to an actual bridge, that being a bridge over the river Cam the Cam Bridge. This is incredibly logical etymology. We can take a brief break from Shires luckily with Norfolk and Suffolk. These names simply mean Norfolk and the South Folk, which are two incredibly simple to understand. And then we have England's smallest county, Rutland. No one actually knows what happens here. The name is thought to possibly mean Rota's land, with Lotta being an old chief in the land. Their name is thought to possibly mean cheerful slash bright, which is unexpectedly pleasant. Back to the Shires I'm afraid however, as west of Rutland is Leicestershire, home of the unexpected underdogs of the Premier League a few years back. The county is named after the city of Leicester. This is the first term we have spotted the Cester slash Chester suffix. This means town, but specifically a Roman town. So the city's name is thought to mean a Roman town by the river Ligor, which is thought to be a former name of the river Saw. Next up we have the dullest name county the West Midlands, named so due to being the west of the Midlands. However, it's full of popular cities such as Birmingham, Coventry and Wolverhampton. And to the north of the West Midlands, we have Staffordshire, popular for their dog breed. Here we have yet another ford, with the former part of this name meaning riverbank slash shore. As for Shropshire, this too is named after a settlement, though that settlement is now called Shrewsbury, with Shrewsbury thought to mean the fortified place in the scrub. Cheshire is named after the city of Chester, which as we mentioned simply means a Roman town. Why Lewis Carroll named his books Cat after this county however I am not too sure. Derbyshire is named after the place of Derby, which comes from an old English and means a deer village. Robin Hood's Nottinghamshire is named after the city of Nottingham, which means homestead of snot people, with snot being a former chief here. Not the most pleasant name I'm sure we can all agree. And Lincolnshire is named after the city of Lincoln, which is a Latin name coming from a word meaning pool slash lake. Apologies for whizzing through all these shires just then, they're just starting to make my head spin. Though the biggest shire is of course Yorkshire. The York part of this name comes from the city of York and is thought to mean yew tree estate. Yorkshire is so large that it's actually split into four counties. Three of these are simply called North, West and South York. Yorkshire. The East Yorkshire is actually called the East Riding of Yorkshire. The other parts of Yorkshire are known as Ridings too, but the word isn't present in their official names. Riding is a term of Viking origin and simply means a third part, as historically Yorkshire was split into three of these ridings. It makes sense for the word to be of Viking roots, as Yorkshire really was the hub of the Viking conquest of Britain. Next up, we have the county of Greater Manchester, which contains perhaps the second most well known city in England outside of London, Manchester. The greater part relates to the wider area, but Manchester itself is actually thought to mean breast-like hill, due to the shape of hills in the area. I feel like more people should be talking about this. West of Greater Manchester, we have Merseyside, which contains another famous English city, Liverpool, home of the Beatles of course. The county's name comes from the River Mersey, with the name Mersey meaning Boundary River, maybe because it's so close to the Welsh border. And we have one fine Shire, Lancashire, which is named after the city of Lancaster, which means Roman town on the River Loon. Continuing up north, we have Cumbria, the northwesternmost point of England. And we actually have an entire video about this name somewhere on the channel. This is actually a Celtic name and means land of the Cumley, the people who live there. This relates closely to the Welsh name for Wales, Cumley, as they are both Britonic words meaning fellow countrymen. East of Cumbria, we have County Durham. This is named after the town of 
of Durham in the county, and the name simply means a city on a hill, as it is well, a city on a hill. And above Durham is the county of Tyne and Ware, which contains most noticeably the wonderful city of Newcastle upon Tyne. This county is simply named after the two rivers that run through it, the Tyne and the Ware. And finally, we reach England's northernmost point, Northumberland. This name is pretty darn simple, especially once you know there's a river called the Humber nearby. This name simply means the place north of the river Humber. And there you have it, from Cornwall and its Horn people, Manchester and its not safe for work hills, and the many, many shires. This has been a journey across my home nation of England, and how its counties got their names. Indonesia really is a country like no other. With a population of around 270 million people, it is the fourth most populated nation on the planet, just behind the USA, India and China. Not only is its population huge, the nation itself takes up a huge amount of space. From its westernmost point to its easternmost point, it's over 500 kilometers in length. That's basically the length of Europe. However, that's not to imply that Indonesia is just one massive mass of land. In fact, the thing that makes Indonesia perhaps most interesting is its geography. Indonesia isn't connected to any continental mainland, but calling an island nation like the likes of Iceland or the UK doesn't do it justice either. Indonesia is a nation fond of islands and parts of islands across Southeast Asia. In fact, the nation is thought to be made out of just over 18,000 islands. Though despite this, it somehow isn't the nation with the most islands. Sweden takes that crown with just under 270,000 islands. Still, the nation with the fifth most island is no laughing matter. These 18 thousand islands vary from tiny rocks only visible at low tide, to secluded havens of natural beauty and animals found nowhere else on the planet, to islands of sprawling cities making themselves home to Indonesia's massive population. And while we won't be looking into all 18,000 plus island names I'm afraid, let's look into how the nation's most well known islands and groups of islands got their names. The largest island to be included in Indonesia is the island of New Guinea, which is actually the second largest island on the planet. It. However, only the western half of the island is part of Indonesia, with the eastern half being the independent nation of Papua New Guinea. We have covered this island and its many names in the past. The Papua part seems to be the more Indonesian part of the name, as the Indonesian section of the island is split into two provinces simply called Papua and West Papua. There are a few ideas as to where the name Papua comes from. One idea is that it comes from a term meaning not united, in reference to the many ununited tribes on the island, while another idea is that it comes from a Malay word meaning frizzy hair, in relation to the appearance of the natives. It was the natives appearance that inspired the name of New Guinea too, as when this island was visited by European settlers, the natives reminded them of the natives of the Guinea area of Africa. West of New Guinea are the Maluku Islands, also known as the Moluccas. There are thought to be around 1,000 of these islands under themselves, hence why we won't be looking into all their names. Though where does the name for this archipelago as a whole come from. One idea is that it comes from Malay too and means things like main slash chief island, perhaps due to their central location. However, a more unique idea is that the name means head of a bull. Why however, I am not too sure. Maybe it's because the outline of this archipelago looks like a bull's head, which I can kind of see, I guess. When these islands were under European powers, however, they were known as the Spice Islands due to the exotic spices grown here and traded throughout the world. Old. Spices like nutmeg and mace could only be produced here. The largest of the Maluku Islands is Halmahela. The name simply means motherland, which makes sense as it's the largest of these islands. However, it went by a completely different name too, that being Jilolo slash Gilolo slash Jailolo. Unfortunately, however, I wasn't able to find out what exactly this name means. If anyone knows, then let me know down in the comments. Another chain of tiny islands that make up part of Indonesia are the Riau Islands. These islands are tiny, with the largest of them, Bintam, having a land area of just over 1,000 square kilometers. Yet despite this, these islands as a whole are home to over 2 million of the Indonesian population. Some even think that the name for these islands come from this high population, with ideas that the name of Riau comes from words meaning things like loud slash noisy slash crowded due to all the people here. In the past these islands were the centre of trade, so even way back then the islands would have been pretty busy it would seem. Another idea however is that it comes from Portuguese explorers in the land and their word for river, Rio. 
a much smaller collection of islands simply called Banka Bilitang Islands. Called this as it's compromised the two main islands called Bangta and Bilitang. Banka is the large of the two and has a deep history of mining. Mining tin specifically. So it's only fitting that the name of this island comes from a Sanskrit word meaning tin. Bilitang seems to have a mineral based name too. A unique stone known as Batu Satam which means bile of the sand possibly due to its gold bladder like shape. It's also known as black meteorite. The Dutch called this mineral bilitonite which was then applied to the island's name as a bilitung. Undoubtedly, however, the main area of Indonesia lies across the Sunda Islands. These islands hold a majority of Indonesia's population and tourist sites. In fact, some of these islands are home to more than just the nation of Indonesia. It seems that this name, which is also applied to other geographic features in this region, comes from the Sundanese people, an ethnic group for one of the islands in this chain. We don't seem to be sure where exactly this name comes from, but Wikipedia lists ideas such as it meaning things like good goodness or beautiful excellence. I also heard that Sunda is one of the 1000 names of Vishnu so perhaps it relates to the god. Either way I definitely want to look into these 1000 names of Vishnu one of these days. There are so many of the Sunda Islands that they are more commonly separated into two areas, the Greater and Lesser Sunda Islands. Let's start with some of these Lesser Sunda Islands shall we? Start on the island of Bali. This island is the main tourist destination of Indonesia, known for its beaches, temples and nightlife. Perhaps it could be considered the Ibiza of the Eastern Hemisphere, though I'm not sure how well that analogy works on people outside of the UK. The name Bali itself seems to be rather ancient, with it being recorded on a pillar dating from around 900 AD. One idea I read is that it comes from the teachings of a man who journeyed across the island. His teachings were known as Bali, and this word came from the word Bibali, which means offering, which is somewhat fitting, as now the island of Bali has a lot to offer the tourists who come to visit it from around the world. East of Bali is the island of Lombok. This island seems to enjoy tourism too, but not to the extent of the neighbouring Bali. One source explains that the name comes from the Sasak language, meaning straight. Though what's straight about it I'm not too sure, because this island is more or less a big circle. Perhaps the strait relates to the straightest part in the southwest, or maybe a strait of water between this island and its neighbours. Carrying on we have Sumbawa. This is a name I couldn't find out too much about I'm afraid. It seems it originally applied to just one half of the island, the half the native Semawa people lived in, so perhaps Sumbawa comes from Semawa. The name of the next lesser Sunda island, Flores, kind of sticks out and that's because this island has maintained its name of European origins. This is a name of Portuguese root and initially they called the island Cabo de Flores which means Cape of Flowers. So by now the island's name simply means flowers. I guess this must be a rather pretty looking island then. And then we have Sumba too. This island is most likely named after the native Sumba people. These guys have been here for many years and seem to pride themselves on sticking to their ancient traditions despite the changing world around them. However where their name comes from I'm not too sure. The final lesser Sunda island I want to talk about is of interest as it's another case of Indonesia sharing an island with another nation, this being the island of Timor. The western part of this island belongs to Indonesia and is simply known as West Timor, while the eastern part of it is its own nation which is creatively called East Timor, also known as Timor Lest. As Timor Island is one of the easternmost islands of the Lesser Sundas and Sundas as a whole, it makes sense that the name would simply mean East, coming from the Malay Timor meaning East. So if Timor means East, then yes that means the nation of Timor East literally means East East. I mean it's very accurate I suppose. Names like this are more common than you might think. They are called tautological place names. Wikipedia has a whole list of them, but they can be a story for another time. On to the big hitters now, the Greater Sunda Islands, the first of these being Borneo. This island is actually home to three nations, the only island on the planet to do so in fact. A large part of it is Indonesian, a part of it is Malaysian and the tiny country of Brunei also calls the island home too. While most of the world knows this island as Borneo, in Indonesia the island, or at least the part they rule over, is known as Kalimantan. Long time viewers may remember we already have a 
video on this subject, so go check that out if you haven't already. But let's cover it here too. The name of Borneo is believed to come from a Portuguese corruption of Brunei, which was once used for much more of the island, before being the name of just the small nation on it, and this name is thought to simply mean land slash region. Kalimanta, on the other hand, has several theories in regards to what the name means. The idea I like most is that the name means island with burning air, due to just how hot it gets there. Sulawesi is an island with an incredibly unique shape. It is the fourth largest island that makes up the nation and its third most populated. In the past, this island was given the name Celebes. This name was of Portuguese origins and may come from the term Os Celebres, meaning famous ones, in reference to its capes that were famously dangerous to navigate around. Though another idea is that it's simply a Portuguese corruption of that native name of Sulawesi that is used once again. So where does the native name come from? The general consensus is that the latter half of this name means iron, as iron was historically mined on the island. The former half is thought to either mean island, which gives it the fitting name of iron island, or spike slash horn, so the name may mean iron spike in relation to the iron weapons made here. Maybe the former part could mean spike and island. It could be the island of spiked iron, which is a pretty badass name for a place if I do say so myself. Sumatra Island is the biggest island in the nation that entirely belongs to Indonesia. There's no extra nations claiming land here it would seem. There's a couple ideas as to where the name for this island derives from. One is that it simply means Ocean Island, as it's an island in the ocean, which makes sense or isn't the most exciting. A much more exciting etymology is that the name means Gold Island. This makes Sumatra another mining related name, as once upon a time gold ran deeply through this island, so much so that it was named after it, though Gold Island does sound like the name of a James Bond villain hideout. And finally we have not only the most populated island of Indonesia, but the world's most populated island full stop, Java. This island contains the nation's capital and homes over 140 million people. Despite this achievement for the island, the name actually derives from more humble origins. It's believed to come from the Sanskrit Yavad Vipa and means island of Bali due to the crop growing there. The fact this island is named after Bali and the fact that the island next door is called Bali but is not named after the crop is just a coincidence I think. Though funnily enough, despite this name, the island of Java became more well known for growing something else. Coffee. Java coffee became so popular across the globe that Java simply became another name for coffee in general, regardless of whether it actually came from the island of Java. Okay, so before I get swamped by a wave of enraged Spaniards, I have to address the elephant in the room. Yes, I know these areas of Spain aren't officially called regions. From what I can find, the proper title for these areas of land are autonomous communities, or even just autonomies. So why am I calling them regions in the title of this video, and most likely sticking with that term for the rest of the video? Well, it's for a couple of reasons. Despite not being their proper name, I've seen other sources refer to these areas as regions of Spain, and also regions of Spain just sounds better and easier to understand in the title of a YouTube video than Autonomous Communities of Spain. Perhaps one that'll explain to you what goes into the name of a YouTube video. Anyway, like most countries on our planet, Spain is too split up into various regions, each with their own unique identity, histories, and of course, names. While most of these regions are found in mainland Spain on the Iberian Peninsula, some are a bit further afield, some reside in the middle of the ocean and seas, and there's even a couple that are in a completely different continent. Continent. So today, let's find out how the 19 autonomous communities <coughs> regions <coughs> of Spain got their names. Let's start things off in Spain's northwest corner with the region of Galicia. This region is believed to be named after the Celtic tribe who called this part of the world home many years ago, the Galaki. Of course, there's more to this story, however. There seems to be a few ideas as to how these people got their name. One idea is a bit more sensible and thinks the name may mean things like people of the hill slash forest. This is a pretty stereotypical naming idea. However, the idea 
idea I like more as to where the name comes from has it relating to milk of all things. Spanish scholar Isidore of Seville believed that the name for this tribe and the name for the Gauls themselves came from the Greek word for milk, as their skin tone was of a lighter colour compared to other European inhabitants, like the colour of milk. So the name of this region could be interpreted to mean land of the milk coloured people. And yes, I am very aware there's a region in Eastern Europe called this too. One day we'll look into why these places have the same name, I promise. To the east of Galicia, we have Astolias, which is officially a principality, but in the past was a kingdom unto itself, which covered this land area plus more. This is seemingly a pretty ancient name, as it's still not entirely clear to us in regards to what it means. There seems to be a handful of etymological ideas, and what seems to be the common theme in them is that the name relates to water, which makes sense as there are many waterways in the region, and its northern border is the Bay of Biscay. The most popular idea is that the name comes from Basque origins, from their words for rock and water, so the name means land where water flows from rocks or something along those lines. Carrying on east we have the region of Cantabria. One idea is that this name is of Celtic root and means rocks slash rocky due to the terrain in this part of the world. However something I noticed about this name was how similar it is to the name of Canterbury, a city here in England in the county of Kent. Canterbury and Kent both come from the same etymological roots, the Celtic cant, meaning things like coastal district or corner land. There's actually an idea that this Spanish region's name also comes from these same Celtic roots. It would make sense for it to mean coastal district as it borders the sea but is not particularly in any corner. It's an interesting idea and would explain why these two names in different nations are so similar. They were both once inhabited by Celts after all. Basque County may be a region of Spain, but Basque unto itself is a much larger concept which includes the language called Basque as previously mentioned that came from this region and Basque is an ethnic group of Europe unto itself too. The name Basque is thought to come from Latin roots with their word Vascones. It's thought to mean foresters due to where they live but other ideas have the name meaning mountain people, tall ones or proud one. Whichever one is correct the Basque region of Europe seems to be proud of their unique identity. In the Basque language it has a completely different name, Euskaladunak. This name however seems to be of a more unknown etymology. Next to Basque County is the region of Navarra. This seems to be a place with a strong Basque influence too, and one idea is that the name comes from Basque origins meaning valley or plains, once again due to the landscape of the region. A different idea however is that it comes from another Basque word, Navarre, which means multicoloured or brown due to how the colour of the landscapes here contrasted with the predominantly green lands in other parts of this area. Either way, it's another region named after what the land looks like. Below both Basque County and Navarra lies the region of La Rioja. The first part of this name may seem pretty familiar to some of us, and that's because Rio is a word we see in other place names like with Rio de Janeiro. Rio in Spanish and Portuguese means a river, so this region of Rioja was named after a river, but what river? Well, while you may think it will be called just the Ya, and they just put Rio and the Ya together, that's not entirely correct. The river is actually called the Oya, so as it starts with an O and Rio ends with an O, they simply use the same O and just mush the words together. Oya in Spanish means watch out, so maybe the name of this river was a warning for the river itself. Next we have the region of Aragon, which was also a kingdom unto itself many years ago. While sounding similar to his name, it has nothing to do with a certain king of Gondor. This region is named after a river that runs through it, that being the river Aragon, much like Rioja. As to how this river got the name itself, well it seems to be of just Proto-Indo-European roots meaning water, which makes sense, rivers are just water after all. And in Spain's northeastern corner we have the region of Catalonia, which like Basque County has a strong unique identity unto itself with its own language and ethnicity. Catalan. Where their name and the land's name comes from however is debated. Wikipedia and its various sources have compiled a few ideas as to where the name comes from. One idea is that it means land of the Goths, as the initial settlers came from Goth ruled lands. Other ideas have Catalonia meaning land of castles, as there are many impressive castles in the land. And another idea is that the name Catalan comes from Celtic root and means chiefs of battle. I guess they were pretty good at fighting. As we start to venture south we come to the large 
largest region of Spain, Castilla and Leon. This area's name comes from two previous kingdoms that reigned in Spain, Castilla and Leon. Now these are pretty darn straightforward to explain if you haven't guessed them already. Though if you're still struggling then look at these former kingdoms flags and you should know by now. Castilla is named after their castles and Leon is named after lions. As it was a kingdom it means there would have been actual kings of Leon and I reckon their music was probably better too. And in the centre of Spain, we arrive at the community of Madrid, named after the nation's capital city, which is of course in this region, Madrid. So for this one, we need to look into how the city got its name. Despite being a landlocked region, more or less in the dead centre of a country known for its warmer climate, Madrid is too thought to come from watery origins. This is because while it may not have any coast, there is a river running through it. One idea is that the city was initially called Matrice, meaning water, an old language, while another idea is that it came from the Arabic term mela, meaning water too, or even meaning a giver of life. On the Spanish-Portuguese border, we have the region of Extremadura. One theory is that this name is of Latin origin, initially being Extremadoli, meaning end of the Duelo River, with the Duelo River being yet another river that runs through the country. This region is seen as being home to the southern end of this very river, hence how it ended up with that name. Another idea is that it has this name because it's in the extreme of Spain, further away from the coast and more civilised areas of the nation, though these are both just ideas. Castilla La Mancha might seem like a pretty large area of Spain, and while that's the case it's not particularly populated. The Castilla part once again means castle, man the Spanish do love a good castle, while the Mancha part means stain. While it means stain I'm not too sure why, it certainly is an odd thing to name something after. Maybe this region is seen as a stain upon the rest of Spain. No offence if you're living here however, I'm, I'm sure it's wonderful. On Spain's east coast we have the Valencia community, which like the community of Madrid is named after the region's capital city, Valencia. The city was founded by the Romans and was initially called Valencia Editorum, meaning Fort of the Editani, who were a tribe that lived here. There was time went on, their name disappeared from the city's name and just the Valencia part stuck. This means things along the lines of strength and valor and victory. As I mentioned in a recent fun with first names video, which you should totally watch by the way, they're really good fun. Pretty much every name starting with V somehow relates to victory in one way or another. Now onto Spain's most populated region, Andalusia. Despite being such a large region, the name comes from an even larger region, that being the old Arabic name for the entire Iberian Peninsula. The Arabic name for the land was Al-Andalus. This name is thought to come from a Latin name meaning country of the Vandals. Latin speakers named it this around the end of the Roman Empire as they saw the Germanic people who descended upon their kingdom, including Iberia, as exactly that, Vandals. And now for our last region on the Iberian Peninsula, Mercia. While it might sound like a poor job at pronouncing America, it doesn't relate to the land of the free. Mercia, as well as being the name for this region, is the name for the main city in the region too, like with Madrid and Valencia. It's thought to come from Latin and mean a land of the myrtle, with myrtle being a flower that grew in large quantities in the land. It's time we set out to sea now, with the island-based region of Spain, the Balearic Islands. This includes the popular tourist destinations on Mallorca, Menorca and Ibiza just to name a few. There's a couple ideas as to where the word Balearic comes from. The traditional idea is that's of Greek origin and means the slingers, in reference to their weapons, which I guess would have been a sling of some sort. Spain has two regions that are actually known as autonomous cities, and they both reside in Africa just across the Strait of Gibraltar. They're the cities of Setua and Melia respectively. The name Ceuta came from some very long-winded origins. The city is surrounded by seven hills, which in Latin is Septum Fratres. Over time, the former part of this name was corrupted into Setia via Arabic and other languages. The name Melia, on the other hand, isn't as known to us, but one idea is that it relates to honey of all things, much like the further away island nation of Malta. And finally, all the way off the west coast of Africa, we have the Canary Islands. These islands are not named after the birds, the birds are named after the islands. So then, what are the islands named after? Well, they are named after a different kind of animal dogs. The name comes from the Latin Canaria Insula, which means island of the dogs, because many dogs lived on the island. So the birds are named after the islands, and the islands are named after dogs. 
country as massive as India, in both a geographic and population sense, means that it can't be governed as just one massive land area. Like all nations on our planet, India breaks down into smaller subdivisions. In the case of India, we have states. However, India is way more than just a collection of states. The country is comprised of other areas too, including things called Union Territories, and even some autonomous areas. It all seems a tad confusing, that's for sure. So, to try and keep things simple here, I'm just going to stick to the 28 states that make up India. Perhaps we can look into these other areas of India another time. Not including these Union Territories, however, doesn't mean we are skimping out on names though, as India is comprised of 28 states. That's more than enough names for now I think. So let's get into these states and find out how exactly they got their names. However, I just want to say, I've read some debate as to what are considered states and what are considered capital territories. For this video, I've used Wikipedia's list of states, so if you are angry with a place I have or have not mentioned this video, go be angry at them, I'm just regurgitating this information to you. Also, apologies for my mispronunciations in this video, I use Forvo to check how to pronounce things, but sometimes I still can't get it quite right, as I'm sure you all know. Anyway, the northernmost state of India, just under some of the nation's union territories is Himachal Pradesh. This is a good one to start with as the word of Pradesh is going to be popping up a few times in this video as it appears in other state names. This is because this word means things like state slash province so it makes sense as to why it would pop up frequently. The Himachal part of this name means snowy slope slash snow laden. This is because the state is rather snowy as it's in proximity to the snowy Himalayan mountains. Punjab is a name that has become somewhat stereotypically Indian to the outside world. But first and foremost, this is the name of this state. Punjab comes from Persian origins and means the five waters. The five waters that make up its name relate to five rivers that run through the state that provide a vital water source for many who live there. Uttarakhand is another state in northern India and this one really lets you know it's in the north from its name alone as the state's name comes from Sanskrit and simply means northern lands. Haryana is a state with a name that relates to India's largest religion, Hinduism. Hali is another name for the Hindu god of Vishnu and that's where the first part of this name is thought to come from. The latter part of this name is thought to mean home, so the name is thought to mean something along the lines of home of Vishnu. I've also read that it may relate to Shiva instead of Vishnu however. Either way, it's a religious name, that's for sure. Rajasthan is India's largest state by land area and a state very heavily linked with the royalty of India. This royal link is present in the state's name too as it literally means the land of kings. Kings. This most likely links to the Rajput dynasty of India. Uttar Pradesh is India's most populated state. It once again has Pradesh in its name meaning state. So what about the Uttar part of this name? Well it ties in with another state name we covered earlier. Remember how that one meant northern land? Well this one simply means northern state. While one is more northern than the other, I guess they are both pretty northern in the grand scheme of things in India. As we venture east, we arrive in the state of Bihar. This is another abode based name, coming from the Sanskrit word Vihala, which simply means abode. This is because in the past, this region of the world was home to many Buddhist monks. It was an abode for them. As we go further east, we arrive in the Indian Bengal area, which envelops the nation of Bangladesh. We first find the state of Sikkim. This name comes comes from the Limbu language and means new palace or house which is thought to be in honour of the area's first ruler. Then we have the state of Assam slash Ahom depending on how you pronounce it. This is a name we don't seem to be too sure about exactly in regards to where it came from. The popular idea is that it relates to the native Ahom people who lived there and was anglicised by the British into Assam. As to where their name comes from however, it's thought to possibly mean things like peerless or unequalled as there were no other people quite like them in the area. Arunachal Pradesh has that word for state in it yet again. This name is a reference to its eastern position. I've seen it meaning dawnlit mountains, as the sun dawns in the east. However, I also read it means a land of the rising sun, which is a name more strongly linked to another part of the world, that's for sure. Below this state is Nagaland. This name is thought to come from the Naga people, who aren't from India but instead from the neighbouring nation of Myanmar. There's an idea that their name means people with earrings. As for Meghalaya, 
This is another abode based name, this time meaning abode of the clouds. Carrying on in northeast India, we have the state of Manipur. This name is believed to come from Sanskrit too and mean jeweled land slash abode. What's so jeweled about it, however, I'm not too sure. Maybe it's rich in precious minerals, or maybe it's jeweled more metaphorically, as it has much green landscape. Chilipola's name comes from words of tui meaning water and pla meaning near. I guess this is because it's pretty near the waters of the Bay of Bengal. Finally, in this northeastern nook, we have Mizoram. This is another state named after the people native to the land, the Mizo. The rampart is the Mizo word for land, so it could be seen as simply meaning Mizoland. From India's easternmost point to its westernmost point, we arrive at the state of Gujarat. This state's name is too thought to come from a group of people, with that group of people being the Gujarat, though they aren't thought to be natives but instead a subtribe of the Huns who ruled this part of India in the past. Madhya Pradesh is definitely India's most central state, and its name very much reflects this fact, as it simply means central state. Names like this make things a whole lot easier for me, that's for sure. Back in the east, we have have Jharkhand. This is a state with a name of Hindi origins. The first part of this name means bush slash forest and the latter half means land. So the state's name means bush slash forest land. A very fitting name for a very green part of the nation. West Bengal might seem like a very obvious name. However, looking at a map of India proves that this name is somewhat contradictory as it's in the east of India. While this is the case, it is the western part of the Bay of Bengal. So despite seeming quite odd at first, this name does make sense. One place is east is another place is west, I suppose. As we venture further south, we get to the state of Maharashtra. The first part of this state means great, like we see with the title of Maharaja, meaning great king slash ruler. The latter part of this name, however, comes from the term Olati. This is believed to be the name for a kind of horse-drawn chariot of the past, or even the name of the person pulling the chariot. This region is thought to be named after this carriage slash occupation, as it was these vehicles that drove people into India is more southern areas in the first place. The Indian state of Chhattisgarh is kind of like the name Punjab in the fact that this name is composed of a number followed by a geographic feature. For Punjab it meant five rivers, here it means 36 forts. The first part of this name comes from the Hindi Chattis meaning 36 and the latter part comes from the Hindi word for fort. Gar. The state obviously has this name because there are 36 forts in the area. Odisha seems to be a state with a rather ancient name. So old in fact we don't seem to be too sure as to where it exactly comes from. An older form of the name dates back to 1025 AD and until 2011 the state was known as Odisha. Despite knowing it's so old we don't unfortunately seem to have any clue as to what it means. Goa not only has the smallest land area of any state but the smallest name too. Just three little letters. This too is a name we unfortunately aren't too sure about. It seems to have been a Portuguese corruption of the area's native name. There seems to be a few ideas as to how the state of Karnataka got its name however. One idea is that it means elevated lands, I guess due to the geography of the region. Though another idea has it relating to the Kolunada people who once lived there. Back north a little bit we have Telangana. This is another state with a number based name. This name comes from the term Trilinga Disa, which means land of the free lingas, with a linga being a sort of symbol in honour of Shiva. This is because there are three ancient temples honouring Shiva in this state. South of here we have one final Pradesh state, that being Andhra Pradesh. This very fittingly translates into meaning southern province slash state, to go along with the other cardinal direction based states we have covered so far. This however isn't the southernmost state. Two states call southern India's tip their home. In the southwest we have Kerala. This is a name we aren't too sure about it would seem. It's thought to be a name of Tamil origins, which is a language present in southern India as well as northern Sri Lanka. It's thought it might mean downward mountain slope or even coconut palm. And finally in the southeast we have Tamil Nadu, a name that is more obviously of Tamil origins. It has their own name in it. This name simply means Tamil country, as this is where the Tamil people and language originated from. And that's how all 28 states of India got their name. I must admit, when I was faced with making this video, I was kind of stressed out at the idea. I thought these names would have deep 
ancient, not really clear to us origins, which ultimately wouldn't make for very enjoyable viewing. And while some of them are fundamentally unknown, many of these names have very clear, simple, fun etymologies. I really didn't expect fun, simple etymologies like this out of this part of the world, which is a mistake on my behalf, that's for sure. This etymological tour of India's state is a pleasant reminder that while many things are different around the world, some things are pretty similar, like how we name our regions, regardless of if you're in Europe, like myself, over in the Americas, or all the way over in India. Island of Ireland is made up of 32 traditional counties, though if you are familiar with the island you will know that these 32 counties by no means make up just one nation. This is because the island of Ireland is home to two different countries. The majority of the island is made up of the independent nation of the Republic of Ireland, and the northern tip of the nation houses Northern Ireland, one of the four nations that make up the United Kingdom. Of course this has created all kinds of confusion and annoyance over the years throughout Ireland's history. In the sake of names however, we're going to put those differences aside for just a short amount of time and cover all 32 of these counties, both the ones of the Republic of Ireland and the ones of Northern Ireland. This is because all these counties are really worth looking into and these two nations histories are so intermixed that I really wouldn't be giving you the complete history if I didn't cover them all. So let's put our differences aside and find out how all 32 counties of Ireland got their names, though some quick ground rules. I'm going to be using the English names of these counties, however they also have Irish names too, which while a lot of them sound different, they actually have the same etymological roots. Also an interesting quirk with these county names is that the actual word of county precedes their unique name, so be prepared to hear me say the word county a lot. Also just to cover all our bases, the word county unto itself comes from the Latin comitatus, meaning jurisdiction of account. Let's start things off with the counties of Northern Ireland, with the northernmost of those being County Antrim. This county is named after one settlement within it, the town of Antrim. The name of this town comes from Irish and means either Lone Ridge or Lone Dwelling. I imagine the name means that when this settlement was founded, it was just a lone person living there. As we continue on in Northern Ireland, we have County Londonderry. Likewise, this is named after the settlement of Londonderry. The Derry part of this name means Oak Grove. As for why it has the UK's capital's name at the front of it, well, that's a whole thing. We have a video about it, and yes, the county is also known as County Derry too. County Tyrone means the land of Owen with Oren being an Irish first name. It seems someone with this name ruled the land here in the past. What's interesting about this one is that Tyrone has gone on to become a popular first name in its own right. County Fermanagh means men of Mana, which roughly translates into men from the county of the lakes. Then we have County Amar, which means Matcha's height. Matcha was supposedly a Celtic goddess important to this land. And then we have County Down. Fittingly, this country is rather down lower in the nation. Down is simply an Irish word for fort, so I imagine that this county must have had an important fort in it. Though that covers the six counties of Northern Ireland, the part of Ireland which is part of the United Kingdom. Though despite being called Northern Ireland, the northernmost point of the island of Ireland actually belongs to the Republic of Ireland. This is with County Donegal. This too comes from Irish and means fort of the foreigners, with these foreigners being Danes slash Vikings who must have had a settlement in this land. It might seem odd to think that Vikings got this far, but if you remember our Icelandic naming video, we talked about how Vikings would make pit stops in Ireland to pick up women and slaves. Classes ever Vikings. Though below Northern Ireland we have County Monhan. This name simply means hilly land due to the geography of the region. It's also thought to translate into English to mean bushy slash hilly field. And below this county we have County Cavern. This translates into meaning the hollow, with a hollow being a large wooded sunken area of land. Before we continue it's worth stopping here, as these six counties that make up Northern Ireland and these additional three counties of the Republic of Ireland actually come together to make up the northernmost province of all of Ireland, Ulster. If you are familiar with the history of the island of Ireland, then this name is most likely somewhat familiar to you, most noticeably with the plantation of Ulster, the name of the colonisation period of this area of Ireland by Great Britain. Many people seem to think that Ulster equals Northern Ireland, and while all of the nation is in Ulster, Ulster also expands into the Republic of Ireland too. This is why I said we have to cover all these counties as their histories are so intermixed. It seems some also think that Ulster is just the Irish name for Ireland, but that isn't the case. That name is Ear. 
also that comes from seemingly pretty unknown origins, however. It seems to mean the men of Ulhai, with Ulhai being an ancient name for an ancient tribe of people who lived in this land. Ulster is just one province of the island. The island of Ireland is split neatly into four provinces, one in the north, east, south and west. So as well as looking into the counties, we might as well cover these provinces names too, considering that we just covered Ulster. Ireland's westernmost province is called Connaught. It seems that this province's name comes from an ancient mythical kin, that being Con of the Hundred Battles. Can you by any chance figure out how many battles he fought in? This province's name was also formally spelt as Connaught. There are five counties in this region, and of course all of them belong to the Republic of Ireland, starting with County Leitrim. This name simply means Grey Ridge. I guess this reflects the county's geography. Carrying on, we have County Sligo. This name name sounds somewhat like the name Slug, and in all honesty, it isn't that far removed from Slugs. The county is named after mollusks, just not slugs. Sligo's name means shelly place slash abounding in shells. This is because there are many shellfish in the waters of this county. Like I said, it's kind of named after slugs. County Roscommon comes from Irish and means a Commons Woods. This county was named after St. Common, who founded a monastery in the county many years ago. County Mayo is unfortunately not named after mayonnaise as cool as that would be. In fact, this name simply means plain of the yew trees, as there must have been a plain full of yew trees here once. Then we have County Galway, the second largest county on the island. County Galway is a very popular part of the nation, so much so in fact that we have an entire video dedicated to its name, well its name and the Scottish region of Galloway. This county is named after the city of Galway in it. It means something along the lines of Stony River, as I imagine there are many stones in one of the many rivers in this county. Ireland's easternmost province of Leinster has 12 counties, far more than any other province. The name of this province itself seems to come from an ancient tribe that once lived here, the Lannin. The northernmost county in this easternmost province is County Lau. This county's name has mythological origins. It seems to be named after the Irish god Lau, who was the sun god and known for his many skills apparently. What exactly those skills were however I'm not too sure. There's also County Longford. This name simply means port slash river fortification, which is a reference to the Shannon River that runs through this county. County Meat in the past was a very important area. It's where the High Kings of Ireland's past resided. This is why the name means middle slash centre, as it was the centre of the Irish government. Also, it's somewhat in the centre of the island too, I suppose. To the west of County Meath is County Westmeath. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you can all understand how this place got its name. Though this technically means West Middle, so can we get a poll going to officially call this area the Irish Midwest please? Anyway, moving on we have County Offaly. This name seems to come from somewhat obscure roots. It seems to be the anglicised form of Ulflary, the name of an Irish kingdom that once resided here. Next door we have County Laish, which is thought to mean the men of Logalagian, who was a man of importance in this land. What's of interest about these last two counties is their former names. They were known as Kings County and Queens County respectively. They were given these names in 1557 by Queen Mary I after herself and her husband Philip of Spain. These counties would have these names until Ireland gained independence. County Kildare is too named after a town with the same name, with that town's name meaning Church of the Oak. Perhaps there was slash is a church by some oak trees in the area. Then we arrive at County Dublin, which of course is home to and named after the nation's capital of Dublin. So for this one we have to understand where exactly the name Dublin came from, which is too something we've covered in the past. It simply means Black Pool, in reference to the dark waters of the river that run through the city either those dark waters or another black liquid the city is known for. Below County Dublin is County Wicklow. This is actually the name of Norse origins and means Meadow of the Vikings. Interestingly enough, County Wicklow actually does have a completely different name in Irish. Its Irish name of Kilimantine means Toothless One, in reference to a story about a saint who had his teeth knocked out in a fight in the area. County Carlo Blower, however, doesn't seem to have an as deep story. It simply means place of cattle. Then we have County Kilkenny, named after the city of Kilkenny. This name simply means the Church of St. Kenneth, 
as the settlement must have contained a church built in his honour. Despite the sounds of the name, its neighbours weren't big fans of South Park unfortunately. Finally, in this province we have County Wexford. This is another Viking name meaning Fjord of the Mudflats. Like Wicklow however, this place has a very different name in Irish, that being Loch Garmon. Loch means lake and Garmon is thought to be the name of a legendary figure in the land. Then we have the counties and islands southern province of Munster. Munster is home to six counties again. The province itself is named after the legendary Irish figure of Mor Mumman. Unfortunately, this province isn't named after the 1960s sitcom slash beastly family of the same name, as cool as that would have been. County Clare simply comes from the Irish word for a plane, and while Clare has become a popular name unto itself, it seems that these two are not related. County Tipperary is named after the town of Tipperary. This town's name simply means well of the Ara, with the Ara being a river that runs through the town slash county. Likewise, we have County Limerick too, which is named after the city of Limerick. Despite now being home to a busy city, Limerick actually means a bare spot. I guess at first there wasn't much here. Also, there once was a man from Limerick. Just saying. Anyway, moving on we have County Waterford, which is Viking 2 and means Ram Fjord. This one has the unique Irish name too of Port Lager, meaning Larag's port, with that being the name of a former important resident. County Kerry has also birthed a popular first name too, and unlike Clare, the first name and the county are related. County Kerry's name means people of Kiar, with Kiar being an Irish word for dark slash black. Maybe these people lived in the shadows, as I can't help but think that this wouldn't relate to skin tone in Ireland in the past. And finally, we have Ireland's largest county, County Cork, and its name simply means swamp. We have another set of United States, those being the United Mexican States, the official name for the country more commonly known as Mexico. Mexico is comprised of 31 states, giving us plenty of names to explain today. And in the same way the names of the USA states are made up of native and settled languages, so the names of the states of Mexico. Except instead of English playing a large role here, it's Spanish. The names of the states of Mexico are a wonderful blend of Spanish as well as the many native tongues of Mexico. Mexico's indigenous people. Some of these names might sound familiar to you too, as things from these states have become known across the globe, carrying their name, from dog breeds to hot sauces. So let's get on with this one shall we, and find out how exactly the states of Mexico got their names. However, before we begin, I'm sure some of you are already annoyed for me saying there are only 31 states, when there are kind of actually 32 states, that extra one being Mexico City. I won't really be including it here for a few reasons. Reasons. One, because it's kind of seen as its own thing rather than another state. Two, because I already have a video all about this name and why it's the same as the entire nation. And three, because the surrounding state is also just called Mexico. All these reasons give me a very valid reason not to cover this one. But yes, that also means that in the country of Mexico, there's a state called Mexico. And by the state of Mexico is a city called Mexico. Also, spare a thought for me and my pronunciation in this video. Forvo is always my go-to place for pronunciations and I'll I'll make sure to check everything there. However, in the quite likely event that I'll say things wrong, go check there for yourself or get mad at me in the comments, whichever option you prefer really. Anyway, let's start from the top, quite literally in this case, with the state of Baja California. This is an interesting one for sure, first because I'm sure you are familiar with the latter half of this name, and secondly because its name kind of contradicts its location in the nation. Baja California means Lower California. Despite being called Lower, it's actually the northernmost state. It is Lower California however as it's below the US state of California, which was once upon a time under Spanish slash Mexican rule. While this area is now split between the two nations, they share a name, with California coming from the mythical island of Calafia from the novel Las Sergas de Esplanandia, which inspired many conquistadors to discover the new world. From what I've seen of California, it's understandable as to why they compared it to an island paradise. Below Baja California, we have the state of Baja California Sur, which name simply means Southern Lower California. I guess it could also mean Lower Lower California too. Together, these two Mexican states and the US state make up a region of the world simply called the Californias. 
As we leave the Baja California Peninsula, we have the state of Sonora. I have seen a few ideas as to how this name came about. One is that it comes from the native Opata language and means place of the corn, while other sources say it comes from the Spanish word sonoros, meaning a loud ringing sound, supposedly because marble deposits in the caves here would ring aloud when struck. The state of Chihuahua is named after the city of the same name within the state, with the city's name believed to mean dry, sandy place, possibly a Nawat. Of course, a breed of dog has also been named after the city slash state that has since found its way into the homes and handbags of people all around the world. Next to this state is Coahuila, which once again is thought to come from Nawat. There are two ideas about this one, both of which are rather different. One idea is that the name means place of many trees, while another claims that the name means serpents that fly. Like I said, rather different ideas. One peaceful and nature loving, one horrifying. Then, over on Mexico's west coast, we have the state of Sinaloa. This name doesn't seem to be as clear to us, but a couple sources point to it coming from a native word for a kind of fruit that has grown throughout this state. Durango is the only state of Mexico with a name of Basque origin, Basque being a language spoken in an area of Spain. This is because the state is named after a city also called Durango City within the state, and this city is named after a city also called Durango over in the Basque country of Spain. How this original settlement got its name, however, we don't seem to know, though one idea points to it meaning water town in Basque. However, this city is rather inland, so that might not be entirely true. Zacatecas State is too named after the city of Zacatecas within it, with this name believed to come from Nahuatl, meaning place abundant with grass. The next state of Nuevo Leon has a name that is pretty easy to understand, even for those like myself who don't speak any Spanish. It simply means New Leon. In O to the former kingdom of Leon that used to take up so much of the Iberian Peninsula. Obviously this name comes from lions, because lions are pretty cool. Over to Mexico's east coast and we have the state of Tamaulipas. This name is thought to simply mean place of high hills slash mountains. I'm guessing this is due to the geography of the land. It looks pretty mountainous from pictures I can see online. The state of Nayarit has a name coming from the Cora language of Mexico. It's believed to simply mean the place of Naya, with Naya being a Cora chief during the 16th century. What I like most about this state's name is that it sounds like a Scottish person saying, nah, you're alright. Next we have the rather small state with a rather long name, Aguascalientes. This name literally translates into meaning hot water. It might seem odd this state having a water based name to begin with as it's so inland. However, it makes more sense when you find that, that all around the state there are many natural hot springs, hence why this state is named after them. The state of San Luis Potosi seems to be named after two things, the first of those being King Louis IX of France. He is the only king to ever become a saint in the Catholic Church. Of course the Spanish Empire was incredibly Catholic, so it makes sense as to why they would name somewhere after this saint. But what about the Potosi part of this name? This part of the name is pulled directly from the city of Potosi in modern Bolivia. So why is this state in Mexico named after this city in Bolivia? Well it's because the state was very rich in silver and other mineable goods. This city in Bolivia was also a mining town too, rich in silver. So the state was named after this city as they both had a huge abundance of silver. The state of Jalisco's name however isn't from quite as deep origins. This is another very literal Nahuatl name. It can be translated into meaning sandy place or place with sand on the ground. As I mentioned it's very to the point. The state of Guaranjato on the other hand has one of the most unique names I've come across yet. It comes from the Prepritcha language and means either mountainous place of frogs or place of monsters monstrous frogs. The region is thought to have this name as the natives of the area believe that the surrounding mountains look like large monstrous frogs. It's a very unique name for a part of the world, that's for sure. Kiritaro State also comes from the Perapitcha language too. However, this name isn't as creative. It simply means a place of cliffs, once again due to its natural geography. The state of Hidalgo is named after one person in particular, that being Miguel Hidalgo Reconstilia, the man who is seen as putting Mexico on the path of independence and by and large is seen as the father of the nation. So it makes a lot of sense as to why state would be named after him. Hidalgo also seems to have been a noble title of Spanish origin too. 
Taking up a large part of Mexico's east coast is the state of Veracruz. This state is named after the city of Veracruz within it, and this city's name simply means True Cross. This True Cross of course refers to the Cross of Christianity. As mentioned earlier, the Spanish Empire was deeply religious, hence why many of these names relate to religion. Vera meaning true, like it does here, is common in English words too, like how the name Veronica means true icon, or even with the word Vera meaning to make sure something is true. The small state of Colima is once again named after the city within it. How this city got its name though we don't seem to be too sure. The best info I could find is that it comes from Nahuatl words for either ancestor or volcano. There is a volcano nearby with the same name so it could more likely be that latter option. The coastal state of Michoacan has a fittingly coastal name, meaning land of the fishermen in Nahuatl. Then we have the state of Mexico, which is in the nation of Mexico and next to the city also called Mexico. As I mentioned, this is a name we've already covered in a video unto itself, so go watch that one for more information on the matter. But in summary, the name comes from the Mexica Aztec people, who are believed to be named after one of their gods, at least that's one idea anyway. Like I said, go check out the video. The state of Morelos is another one named after an important figure in the Mexican War for Independence, this time being Jose Maria Morelos, who took over the revolution when the aforementioned Miguel Hilago Huacosilla was executed. Then we have the state of Puebla, which once again is named after the city of Puebla within it. This apparently just means people. Why this is the case, however, I'm not too sure. The state of Tlaxcala, however, is named after one of my favourite Mexican exports, that being their breads, as this name has been defined as meaning either place of cornbread or more specifically, place of tortilla. I'm hungry just thinking about it. I should really do a video about how Mexican food got its name now that I think about it. There are some really interesting words in their cuisine. Food tangent aside, let's move on to the state of Guerrero which unfortunately is not named after the wrestling legend Eddie Guerrero. Instead, it is named after Vicente Guerrero, another key player in their war for independence. He was a fighter, and luckily enough that surname relates to exactly that, meaning warrior. Not a terrible surname for a fighter and a pro wrestler to have, that's for sure. The state of Oaxaca, meanwhile, is named after a type of tree, rather than a famous person. It's believed to be Nahuatl, meaning the nose of the Juarez, with this nose possibly referring to an edible pod found on these trees. The state of Tabasco might have a name that is familiar with lovers of spicy food. The source makers themselves claim that the name Tabasco means either place where the soil is humid or place of the coral and oyster shells. Then we arrive at Mexico's most southern state, Chiapas. This name is believed to be descriptive yet again and mean the place where the chia sage grows. Interestingly, I only know of chia seeds and kind of forgot they grow into something. The state of Campeche has a name of Maya origins. Supposedly it means place of snakes and ticks, neither of which are the most fondly looked upon creatures. The state of Yucatan has a name with a couple of interesting stories wrapped around it. The most popular of these being the story in which a Spanish conquistador asked the native what they called this place. The native responded with something that sounded like Yucatan, but it actually meant I don't know what you are saying, which the Spaniard presumed was the name for the land. And finally we have the state of Quintana Roo, which is yet another state named after a key figure in the War of Independence, that being Andres Quintana Roo. So from war heroes of Mexico's past to interesting names of native origin, the names of these states really give us an interesting look into the history of Mexico. Notice that the USA and Malaysia have really similar flags. Like, I feel more people should be talking about this. The internet loves videos about flags, and this one seems to be falling under the radar. Unless someone has made a video about it, I just haven't watched it yet. Though, despite how similar these two flags look, from what I can gather, this similarity is little more than a coincidence. The red and white stripes of the Malaysian flag were inspired by the flag of the British East India Trading Company, with the crescent and moon being used due to being a central part of Malaysian culture. Anyway, 
what have the similarities between these flowers got to do with the rest of this video? Well, not that much in all honesty. I just wanted to know for myself why they looked alike and dragged you all along for the ride. Though flags are the only thing that Malaysia and the USA have in common, it would seem, as both these nations are broken down into states. However, like their flag, there are some key differences between the states of the USA and the states of Malaysia. Malaysia only has 13 states, unlike the USA with a whopping 50, which yes, one day I will cover. However, Malaysia also has three federal territories too, though the difference I found most interesting is the fact that nine of Malaysia's states are monarchies unto themselves. Not only are these states monarchies, but Malaysia as a whole has a monarch too. The head of all of Malaysia is decided upon in a meeting held every five years by the monarchs of these individual states called the Conference of Rulers. I mean, there's a little bit more to it than that, but still, that's an incredibly cool concept and sounds like something straight out of a fantasy book. Though for me, the five families of Scranton Business Park come to mind. These states and the federal territories of Malaysia not only have their own rulers, but their own culture, history, landscape, and of course names. You all thought I forgot about the names, didn't you? It is these names we shall be looking into today. Though of course, I just need to give my usual grovel explaining that while I may explain names, saying them correctly is a different story entirely. Unsurprisingly, Malay is not my native tongue, so I might not say all of these names particularly correct. However, I do always check how to say these names and Forvo is my source of choice on all things pronunciation. So if I say anything incorrectly, please feel free to go check how to say them for yourselves. Anyway, let's delve into the names of these states and federal territories of Malaysia. Let's start off with the northernmost state of West Malaysia, Perlis. Not only is this the northernmost state in the western half of Malaysia, but it's also the smallest state from a land area perspective. We don't seem to be entirely sure as to where this name came from however, though there's a whole list of ideas. These ideas range from it meaning gift in a language to it being named after a now extinct type of tree. Another idea has it meaning foot falling into a crack, possibly related to people's feet sinking into mud. Though the most popular theory seems to come from the thought it comes from the phrase Fra Loi, which means coconut washed ashore, because many coconuts were found on the shore of this state. Going south, we have the state of Kurda. It's believed that this name may relate to the Hindustani word of Kadar, which means land suitable for paddy cultivating, relating to rice paddies. This makes sense as paddy fields and rice production is of huge importance to this state. The state of Penang is not only formed from part of the Malay Peninsula, but also a small island. This island is called Penang Island, meaning the state as a whole is named after this island, which is a part of it. Penang is also named after a kind of nut, like Perlis is thought to be too. It's thought it comes from the Malay Palu Penang, which means Areka Nut Island, with the Areka Nut growing on the island. As we head east on the western half of Malaysia, we arrive at the state of Kelantan. This is another state with a handful of etymological ideas. The popular idea is that it means the land of lightning, and as cool as that name is, I'm not too sure why it would be called that. I found no evidence that this part of the nation gets more lightning than others, though let me know if that isn't the case. Other ideas claim the name comes from a type of tree that grows in this area, that it means shiny slash glittering, or that it means clay pool. All different ideas, that's for sure. The state of Perlak has a name that is also the name of something else in Malay, as Perlak is also the Malay word for silver. This has led to many to believe that this state is named after the metal. Supposedly, this state has a large tin mine. While tin and silver are two different metals, clearly the similarities between the two was enough to justify it being named after it. Over on the east coast once again we have the state of Tolanganu, which has some really unique etymological ideas. One idea is that it means bright rainbow, while another idea is that it came from the Malay term Talang Anu, which means fang of something, which relates to a story of a hunter finding a fang of an unknown creature somewhere in these lands. Carrying on south we have the state of Pahang. This name seems to come from mixed origins. It is ultimately believed to be named after the Pahang River which runs through the state. How However, as to where this river's name comes from seems to be a bit more debated. It is thought that this river might be named after a tree that grew in the river once, which was called the Pukok Mahang. Over time, these words came together to become Pahang. One idea is that it comes from the Khmer word for tin, as there were tin mines in this land. The state of Selangor has a wonderful story attached to its name. The story goes that a warrior was escaping from the Portuguese in these lands, and at one point decided to rest under a tree. However, his 
his rest was disturbed by a fly that kept on pestering him. No longer being able to rest, he decided to explore this area and then settle in the land, naming it Sat Si Lango, meaning a large blowfly. This name eventually got corrupted into what it is today. While this is just a story, it's a fun one nonetheless. I don't think I've come across anywhere else named after an annoying fly. Then we arrive at our first federal territory, Puchuraja. This federal territory is compromised mainly of the planned city of the same name, and this territory's city's name comes from Malaysia's first prime minister, Tunku Abdul Rahman Puchula Al Haj. The latter half of the territory's name comes from a Malay word meaning success, to inspire success in the land. Then we move on to the other federal territory in West Malaysia, that being Kuala Lumpur, which I'm sure many of you already know is also the nation's capital. Despite being the very impressive city that it is now, its name is actually from pretty mucky and dirty origins. Many theories on the name point to it relating to mud. This is because Lumpur is quite literally the Malay word for mud. The Kuala part of the name seems to be a tad more debated. The most popular theory, however, is that it means river junction slash confluence, basically where two rivers meet. I can understand why a place where two rivers meet would get rather muddy. It seems that Kuala Lumpur is quite a rivery city, so this name does make sense. Though, as we continue south, we get to the state of Negeri Sambilan, which seems to be the only state name to consist of two words. The latter part of this name is the Malay word for nine, and it relates to nine small districts, known as Negali, which were once part of the country. I'm sure you realise that the former part of this name relates to that term Negari, I just used to. This means that the state's name roughly translates into meaning the nine districts. And yes, these nine districts all have names too, but maybe we can cover those another day. The state of Malacca has another fun story tied to it. The story goes that Parmaswara, the last king of Singapore, was taking a break under a tree while hunting deer with his dog. When a deer appeared, however, it kicked his dog into the river. Parmaswara was so impressed with the heroic action of this tiny deer that he saw it as a good omen and started a kingdom in that place. He named it Malacca in honour of the tree he was resting under, a Malacca tree. A really fun story, though it doesn't involve a dog getting kicked into a river. Someone should go check on the dog. And at the very bottom of West Malaysia we have the state of Johor. Many see this state as the jewel of Malaysia, quite literally as its name means exactly that, coming from the Arabic word of Jahar meaning precious jewel. We must now travel across the sea to arrive at East Malaysia, which is the part of the nation that finds itself at home on the island of Borneo. We have covered Borneo unto itself in a video all about the island's names and history. I'm still impressed here that's the only island on the globe with three nations on it. I think we covered the Malaysian state names in that video too, but there's definitely no harm in being thorough and covering them here too. The Malaysian state of Sabah is in the northernmost tip of the island. The most popular theory on this name is that it comes from a type of banana that are grown here, that being the Pisang Sabah. This sounds logical, we've come across many places named after the produce that grow there. Then we reach the last federal territory in the country, that being Labuan. Labuan is a smaller island off the coast of Borneo and its name is thought to simply mean harbour. This makes sense too, with it being an island surrounded by water and everything. And lastly we have the largest state of Malaysia, Sarawak. This state is believed to be named after the Sarawak River that runs through it, though how exactly this river got its name we don't seem to be too sure. The most popular idea is that it comes from a type of mineral that was mined in this area. So it's a state named after a river named after a mineral. That's certainly a rather unique way for a state to be named. But in this video we've also seen a state named after bananas, a state named in ode of a deer kicking a dog into a river, a state named after an annoying fly, and a city named after mud. It cannot be denied that Malaysia is a very unique country with some very unique names and name meanings. It should come as no surprise that to manage this behemoth of a nation more easily, it is split down into smaller subdivisions, though pretty much every country is broken down into smaller areas, so that should not come as a huge surprise either. Some nations have counties, some have states, and some have counties within states. China's most well-known subdivisions however go by the name of provinces, kinda. 
China's subdivisions actually have a selection of names. While the majority of them are called provinces, some are called autonomous regions, some are called municipalities, and two in particular are called special administrative regions. These different titles for these different subdivisions imply different things, such as the amount of self-control they have and what's actually within them. Though despite this, it seems socially acceptable to refer to them all as provinces, hence why I've called them all provinces in the title of this video. I just know if I didn't mention these different titles, someone in the comments would have. Provinces, municipality, whatever you want to call them. It's not these broad titles we're interested in today, but instead we're interested in the specific names that these subdivisions have. Each province of China has its own name of course. These names relate to a variety of things in these lands, from their geography to their history. So today we're looking into how these provinces slash autonomous regions slash municipalities of China got their name. We won't however be covering those two aforementioned special administrative regions this time around though. If you hadn't guessed that they're Hong Kong and Macau. These two places actually have their own video already on the channel which you can go check for yourself. And as for Taiwan, its relationship with China and the names it uses, that could be a video unto itself too. Let's start with the northwest autonomous region of Xinjiang. Yes, please bear with my pronunciation for those my guiding lights know this. This name means New Frontier as it was the most recent area of land claimed by the Qing dynasty when it was claimed by them, so it was quite literally the land's newest frontier. Then we have the province of Gansu. This name is actually a combination of names from the older regions that make up this province. Ganzhou and Suzhou. Then we arrive at the autonomous region of Inner Mongolia. This is actually a part of a child I've already made a video on, and this name unsurprisingly relates to its proximity to the now independent nation of Mongolia. This is the more Inner Mongolia, as it's more within the landmass of Asia as opposed to Outer Mongolia slash just Mongolia. Ningxiao is another autonomous region, with the latter part of its name coming from the ancient Jia dynasty. The former part of its name, however, comes from the nearby city of Aning. In China's northeast, we have the province of Heilong Zhangjiao, which has an incredible name meaning Black Dragon River. This relates to the dark black waters of the river of the same name that winds like the body of a Chinese dragon. And just below we have the province of Jilin, which comes from the city of Jilin Wula. This name means along the big river, as it's also next to a river. In China's southwest, we have the autonomous region of Tibet, another part of the world with deep history which is a bit out of the realm of today's video. The name Tibet, however, does seem to be of somewhat unknown origins, however. One theory is that it's either a Chinese or Arabic corruption of the indigenous name for the land. Bod. Where Bod came from, however, is a mystery. The province of Xinghai has a name that means Azure Sea, relating to the Xinghai Lake in the region, China's largest lake. It's worth talking about the provinces of Shangji and Shangji at the same time, as the names unsurprisingly have a shared history. Shangji with 1A means west of the mountains, as it is west of the Taihang Mountains, and Shangji with two A's means west of Shang, as it's directly to the west of the Shangji province. These names are actually indistinguishable in Pinyin, Pinyin being the method used to export Chinese names into the Latin alphabet. So for Shangji's name, another form of romanization was used instead, hence why these names are so similar. Moving on however, we have the Hebei province. This name simply means north of the river. This is because this province is north of the Yellow River, that all important river which fostered infant China into the civilization it became. Then we arrive at Beijing Municipality. Beijing is once again a name we've covered before, and how it's not actually different to Peking. This is of course modern China's capital city, so the name simply means North Capital, as this city is more northern than some of the nation's previous capital cities. Boarding Beijing Municipality, however, we have a Tianjin Municipality. Despite having a similar ending to Beijing, this one doesn't relate to the north or capitals. Instead, it means Heavenly Ford. A ford being a crossing in a river, of course. Though, what's so heavenly about this ford exactly, I'm not too sure. Back to provinces, however. This time we have Liaoning, with the first part of this name referring to the Liaon River. The latter part of this name means calm and tranquil. Perhaps this river isn't too rough. 
Then we have Shandong Province, which means East of the Mountains. This name once again refers to the Taihang Mountains. And as for the Henan Province, this means South of the River, that river once again being the all-important Yellow River. The province of Sichuan has a name with a bit of a deeper history however. This name is some form of abbreviation of an older Chinese name which means Four Circuits of Rivers and Gorges. This is because in the past this province was split into four small estates which were called the Four River Circuits. Chongqing is another of China's municipalities. This name means double celebration, which is really fun, but what exactly is a double celebration of beats me. The province of Hubei, however, has a name simply meaning north of the lake, referring to the Dongting Lake. Anhui is another province which has a combination name, coming from putting the city names of Anxing and Guizhou together. This is also the case for the province of Jiangsu too, being a combination of Zhangjing and Suzhou. Then we arrive at China's last municipality, Shanghai. Shanghai is a city by the sea, so it should come as no surprise that its name simply means by the sea, though upon a slash above the sea may be a more fitting translation of the name. The province of Zhejiang is named after the Qiutang River. I know what you're thinking, those names sound nothing alike. Well, initially this river was called the Zhe River, and it's from this older name as to where the province got its name from. The province of Jiangxi has a name meaning west of the river. This refers to the Gun River, not the Yellow River for once. However, the borders of this province have changed over history, meaning this river now goes through the center of the province, not to its west. Hunan province simply means south of the lake, referring once again to the Dongting Lake. As for the province of Guizhou, we don't seem to be too sure as to where its name came from. The most popular idea is that it relates to a mountain called Yu in the area. The Yunnan province has a name meaning south of the Yunling mountains. However, it's also known to mean south of the clouds, referring to the clouds that pierce through these mountains. Guangxi and Guangdong are an autonomous region and province respectively, though despite this bureaucratic difference, their names are very similar. Guangxi means Western Expanse and Guangdong means Eastern Expanse, as these expanses are in the West and East. Once upon a time, however, this was one large region called Liangguan, which meant the two expanses. The Fujian province is once again a combo name, coming from the region's two main settlements of Fuzhou and Jianzhou. Finally, we have China's island province of Hainan. Not only is it an island, but it's also China's southernmost province. So south in fact is seen as being south of the sea, as that is exactly what this name means, south of the sea. And that is all of China's provinces covered, and of course those municipalities slash autonomous regions too. What I found most interesting about this journey through the names of China is that despite how varied the land is, there's a lot of similarity in these names. From referring to their position in relation to a geographic feature, a piece of history has happened in the land, or by simply combining two settlement names together. China's names carry just as much history as the nation of China does itself. a geographic and population perspective, the nation of Brazil is massive. It has a land area of just over 8.5 million kilometers square, making it the planet's fifth largest country, and a population of just over 210 million, making it the planet's sixth most populated country. As I mentioned, Brazil is massive. Luckily, however, to manage with this vast amount of land and people, the nation of Brazil is split up into smaller, easy to manage areas. Brazil is split to 27 areas which are collectively known as federative units, not the catchiest of names I know. 26 of these 27 units however are states, a term we are much more familiar with. That one extra unit is Brazil's federal district in the heart of the nation where the country's capital lies. Because this isn't an actual state and its name is pretty self-explanatory, we won't be covering it here today. Though that does still leave us with those aforementioned 26 states, and luckily for us these states have names which are far more unique and interesting. So today, let's look into how the states of Brazil got their names. 
let's start things off with the nation's northernmost state of Roraima. The state seems to be named after a mountain with the exact same name in the region. Though as to how that mountain got its name, we have a few ideas. The most popular of those being that comes from our Brazil's many native languages and means green peak, reflecting the natural greenery of the mountain. Also in the north of the nation, we have Amapá. This is a Portuguese adaptation of another native name for the land, and we're not entirely sure what it means. One of the more popular ideas, however, is that it means ending land, perhaps reflecting the fact that this is a state on the Brazilian border, e.g. where the land of Brazil ends. Then we have the large Amazonas state, which unsurprisingly is named after the Amazon river that runs through a large amount of the state. As to how the Amazon itself got its name, well that actually has a video unto itself here on the channel. It relates directly to the Amazon warrior women of ancient Greek. Explorers in this part of the world were attacked by a native tribe of women, which reminded them of these Amazons. The state of Aklia is also named after a river, the river Aklia. Its name is thought to mean a green river. Just below we have the state of Rondonia. This name is actually a fairly recent invention, becoming the state's name in just 1956. This name is a tribute to one Marshal Candido Rondon, a famous explorer in Brazil's past. Continuing back up north, we arrive in the state of Pala. This state's name simply means river, in a native language too. However, there also seems to be a river called the Pala River. So yes, this river's name simply means river river. The state of Malanyo is believed to also be named after the Amazon River, despite the fact the two names look nothing alike. Malanon is apparently an alternate name for the Amazon River, and in turn this state was named after this name. The state of Piauian, however, is believed to be named after a species of fish that's found in a river in this state. Carrying along Brazil's east coast, we have the state of Ciela. This is a state also named after an animal, but a bird this time, not a fish. This name is believed to mean it sings the Jandaya, with a Jandaya being a type of parrot found in this land. However, other sources say that the name means a mother of the day or source of light, as the land gets so much sunlight. We are now entering the area of Brazil made of smaller states on its eastern coast. To start with, we have the state of Rio Grande do Norte. You don't have to speak too much Portuguese to understand what this name means. It simply translates into meaning Great River of the North. This definitely won't be the last time we hear Rio Grande in this video, that's for sure though. The name of the state of Pala Iba may sound familiar, as the first half of that name is identical to the previously mentioned state of Pala. In that instance, Pala meant river and it's no different here, with the latter part of this state's name meaning bad slash rough. So the name means rough river, as there must be be a river with some pretty strong current somewhere in this state. The state of Pernambuco has an aquatic meaning to it would seem, coming from a native language and meaning hollow sea. The idea of a hollow sea might sound a tad strange at first, but it seems to relate to reefs off the shore of the state. I suppose reefs could be described as hollow. Next up we have the state of Alagoas. This state has a watery etymology too, deriving from the Portuguese word for lake, as there are many lakes in this state. However, another idea is that the name means flooded field or swamp which are kind of lakes too I guess. The last of the smaller coastal states is the state of Sergipe, with this name believed to mean the river of the crabs. One can only presume that there must be crabs abundant in the rivers here. We aren't free of those water themed etymologies just yet however, as the state of Bahia has a name derived from the old Portuguese word for bays, as it's on a bay. The state of Tocantins however has the best etymology of them all it would seem. This is another water themed etymology but there's a little bit more to it. The name actually is believed to mean toucan beak in relation to the wonderful toucan bird of course. So how does this relate to water? Well it's thought that there was a river or lake in this land that was similar in shape to the iconic beak of a toucan. Like I said it's a pretty fun etymology. Finally we have a state with a non-water themed name. That being the state of Mato Grosso, this name simply means thick grass slash bush in relation to the dense nature of this land. Interestingly enough, this state used to be much larger but was split in two in 1975. 
The lower half of this state became the state of Mato Grosso do Sul, which simply means thick grass of the south. The central state of Goiás has a name which isn't as clear to us. The most popular idea is that the name comes from a community of people who lived here, and their name means in their language people of the same origin, which is very nice and inclusive I feel. If you speak Portuguese, then the name of the state of Minas Gerais will sound pretty obvious to you. This name simply means general mines, as it was here that vast amounts of gold, diamonds and other gems were discovered, so an awful lot of mines opened up in the state. And likewise with the state of Espirito Santo, if you speak Portuguese, you will know this name literally translates into meaning the Holy Spirit, in reference to the Holy Spirit of Christianity. This is not the only religious name we have, as we have the state of Sao Paulo too, named after Saint Paul. And likewise we have Santa Catalina too, named after Saint Catherine of Alexander. Rio de Janeiro's state, however, may be Brazil's most well known, and is of course home to the city of Rio de Janeiro too. This city actually has its own video up on the channel. In summary, the name means River of January, as the harbour this city now stands on was first sighted by Europeans in January. Of course, there is no actual river in Rio de Janeiro, however, they just thought that harbour was a river when they first spotted it and the name stuck around. The state of Palana once again features that word for river in it from a native language of Brazil. So what does the latter part mean this time? Well it simply means wide, as in wide river. And finally we have Rio Grande do Sol. If you remember near the start of this video the state of Rio Grande do Norte and its name meaning Great River of the North, then I'm sure you can figure out for yourself what the Sol in this southerly state's name means. Nevertheless that wraps up neatly how exactly the states of Brazil got their name. Now go let me know how terrible my Portuguese was down in the comments below. The nation of New Zealand is split into 16 regions to help administer the land more easily. However, this does not mean that we'll be covering just 16 names in this video. How is this possible, I hear you asking? Well, this is because of the mixture of names these regions have, which fundamentally boils down to the history that has taken place on these islands. New Zealand in the grand scheme of the world is a very young country, at least as a human settlement anyway. In fact, it was the last large livable area of land to be discovered by us humans. And the first settlers to discover these lands were of course the Maori. It's believed they arrived on the shores of New Zealand somewhere between 1200 to 1300 AD, maybe a little bit after too. While this is a long time ago, it is still pretty recent in human history terms. Over in Europe, for example, Western Rome had been and gone and we were well into the Middle Ages. These initial Maori settlers developed their own culture, language and names for the land, many of which are still in use to varying degrees to this day. New Zealand stayed as a Maori only island for quite some time, all the way up until the mid 17th century. It was in this year that the first Europeans visited, that being the Dutch led by one Abel Tasman. However, he did not get the ball rolling on European settlement on the island. That happened much later on in the 18th century when the British led by one James Cook started to settle in New Zealand. And from here, European names started to sprout up around the land, taking over native names in some cases. The history the nation has faced has left New Zealand with names from various languages and cultures, from native Maori names to names given by European settlers. This can be seen very clearly in the names of the regions that New Zealand's North and South Island have been split up into. Many of the names these regions have are incredibly exotic sounding to a native English speaker like myself, with equally interesting meanings. Some of the other names these regions have however, well, they leave very little to the imagination. Some of New Zealand's regions names even give the states of Australia a run for their money, and long time viewers will know how I feel about those names. Not all hope is lost however, as thankfully for the name inclined like ourselves, these dry names from European settlers are not the only names that these regions have been branded with, as each region has a native Maori name too, so even if its primary name is not of Maori origins, it still has one. Of course what I did just say was of note too, calling the European names of these regions the primary names is definitely a debate we can have another time, and it seems like a lot of people are already having that debate in the nation. There's even rumblings of dropping the name New Zealand altogether. Like I said, that really could be a video unto itself. 
Anyway, this is why I said at the top of this video that despite there being just 16 regions, we have more than 16 names. It's more around 29 names we'll be covering today. So let's find out where exactly the names for these regions came from. And apologies for my Mari pronunciation on this one. I shall, as always, do my best to find out how to pronounce these names properly. Forvo is my guiding light in all this. But sometimes my dumb tongue just can't quite comprehend words it's not familiar with. Starting in the north of the North Island, we have the region of Northland. I did warn you some of these names leave little to the imagination. This name comes from the fact that this land is in the northernmost part of New Zealand. This region's Maori name of Te Tai Tokaru is much more interesting sounding, though from what I can gather, this name seemingly means the same thing. I have seen it translated as meaning just the north, but Wikipedia also claims that it means the north tide, which is just a tad more poetic. We then arrive at the region of Auckland, named for the city of Auckland within it. This name ultimately comes from the area of Auckland in County Durham in the UK, which has a name coming from obscure Old English origins. This area ended up having an earl, that being one George Eden, the first Earl of Auckland. He was also the vice of India and allowed one William Hobson to explore the East Indies. It was during these travels he arrived in New Zealand and claimed land there, naming it Auckland in owe to the Earl that financed and helped set up his travels. The region's Maori name is Tamaki Makolao, meaning the Tamaki of a hundred lovers. It was of one hundred lovers as the land and its natural resources were loved and desired by many. As for Tamaki, we don't seem to be too sure. This unto itself is seen as the Maori name for Auckland, and I also read it may come from the Maori word for battle. Perhaps people fought over the resources this land boasted. Then we have the region of Waikato. This is obviously a Maori name. The first part of this name means water and the latter part means pull. The name is seen as meaning the water's pull. This name comes from the Tainui Maoris, a confederation of various Maori tribes in this region. When these people arrived in this land, they were drawn there by the strong pulls of the waters they sailed on. This is because they arrived at the mouth of a river. It was this strong pull of water that gave this region its name. The Bay of Plenty is a rather unique name. We don't often see the word plenty being used like this. Normally it comes before another noun, but here it is seemingly as the main noun. What exactly is there plenty of in this Bay of Plenty anyway? Well, this name comes from a story that took place here when James Cook first arrived. When landing, the people already there were incredibly generous to Cook and his crew, giving them lots of food and supplies like timber. There was plenty of goods to go around. So in ode to this generosity, Cook dubbed this area the Bay of Plenty, as there was plenty to go around. This region's Maori name of Te Moana Atoi means the Sea of Toi, with Toi being an early Maori settler in this region. The region of Gisborne has a name deriving from the largest city within it, and this city was named after one William Gisborne, a former colonial secretary of New Zealand. The region's Maori name is Te Taiwawiti, which means the coast on the sunrise, and this name comes from the fact that this is the easternmost point of New Zealand, so would be the first to see the sunrise, giving Japan a run for its money. The Hawke's Bay region of New Zealand is once again named by James Cook. He named it after Admiral Edward Hawke, an important figure in the Royal Navy and James Cook's boss. The region's Maori name is Te Matau a Maui, which means the fish hook of Maui. This all relates to the creation myth of New Zealand and the hook the legendary Maui used to drag the island up from the sea. The region of Taranaki is in the west of New Zealand's North Island. This region is named after the huge Mount Taranaki, a dormant volcano. This is of course a name of Maori origins, though at first glance it's a very Japanese looking name. It seems I'm not the only one to notice this similarity between Japanese and Maori either, but that could be a video for itself another time. This name of Taranaki comes from Maori words meaning peak and shining respectively. This is because of the snow covered peak on this mountain, shining in the sun. The region of Manawatu Whanganui has just that Maori name, but it's one of interest. The first part of this name derives from an old Maori song about an early Maori ancestor searching for his wife. In part of this song, he says his heart stopped when he found the river. The Maori words for heart and stop are Manawa and Tatua, respectively. These words made up the first part of this name. The latter part of this region's name is thought to either mean the long wait or the big harbour, which could even 
either reference the Mari in the song Waiting to Find His Wife or just the bay in this region. It's a very unique name, that's for sure. And this may be the first time I've covered a place named after a song lyric. Then we arrive at the southernmost region of New Zealand's North Island, that being the region of Wellington, named of course after the city within it, the nation's capital of Wellington. This city is named after one Arthur Wellesley, aka the first Duke of Wellington. It was this same Duke that the boots are named after too. There seems to be a couple Maori names to this region. The one I shall be covering here today is Te Huanangi Atala, which means the Great Harbour of Atala, with Atala being another legendary Maori figure. We now arrive in the South Island of New Zealand, which despite being much larger is a lot less populated, meaning it's split into less regions. To start with, on this island we have the region of Tasman, named after a certain summer we mentioned near the start of this video. Abel Tasman was the first European to sight the land, hence how his name ended up here. The region's Maori name is Te Tai Olea, and I'm afraid to say I couldn't figure out what exactly this name means. I tried researching it myself and even trying to translate the individual words in English, but no luck. If you have a better understanding of Maori, then please do let myself and others know down in the comments below. I'm sure there's just something super obvious I missed with this one. Hello, so I'm actually currently in the process of editing this video. Look, there it is in iMovies, because I use iMovies to edit my videos, because that's just how I am. Um, I was really annoyed with myself by what I said in that one, saying I don't know where it's come from. So I actually decided to pull my finger out and look into it, because I think it's a bit more obvious I was being a bit lazy and dumb when I first did that. So the uh, first part of this name must mean the bay, because it means the bay in other uh, names, which I've already mentioned, which I'm going to mention in the rest of this video. So I reckon that means the bay. I was just too lazy to try and clock that one I was first writing this video, because I'm very tired, always tired. And as for the latter part of this name, the RAL part, if I'm pronouncing that right, I'm still not 100% sure on that. That seems to be a name that pops up in other parts of New Zealand. From what I can gather, there's a school with this name. But there's also a river with this name, the Areo River, if I pronounce that right once again, in this part of the country. So it must mean the bay of this river. As to how this river got its name in the first place, not entirely sure. I'm going to go back to editing this video. Anyway, the region of Nelson seems to be composed primarily of just the city with that same name. Nelson in New Zealand is named after Admiral Horatio Nelson, the famed British sailor who defeated both the French and Spanish at the Battle of Trafalgar. The city's Maori name of Whakatui simply means build slash raise, relating to the homes the natives used to build here. The Marlborough region is another region named after a noble of some sort, this time being the Duke of Marlborough, John Churchill. Its Maori name is Tietahui Otiwaka, relates to the myth of Maui once again, meaning the prow of his canoe. This all comes from the myth of this island being his canoe. As we travel down the south of the island, we arrive at the region on its west coast, called the West Coast region. Easy to figure out, I know. Its Maui name is Tietai Putini, which means something along the lines of the coast of Putini, with Putini being another legend of Maori mythology. Canterbury is the most populated region in the South Island. This name ties, of course, to the city of Canterbury in the UK, specifically with the Archbishop of Canterbury, who was John Bird Sumner at this time. The Archbishop of Canterbury is a pretty big deal, hence why it is named after him. The Maori name of Watahai seems to come from the name of a historic Maori tribe of the same name that once lived in this part of the nation. The region of Otago has a name of interest because this name and its Maori name of Otaku are one and the same. The former is just its anglicization. This name ultimately comes from a small village in the region and is believed to be an isolated village or place of red earth. Finally, we reach our last region. Remember how the first region we covered was called Northland? Well, this one is called Southland, as it's the southernmost land on the southern island. Its Maori name of Molihiku means pretty much the same thing, translating to the tail end of the land, which is pretty fitting, as this is the tail end of this video. The nation named after silver. It's the home of the tango, 
delicious wine and meat, Diego Maradona and his divine appendage. Even the ballpoint pen has its origin in this land. Argentina is a country with a population of over 45 million people and a land mass of over 2.78 million kilometers square. With that many people and that much land, it's easy to see why Argentina is split into many smaller areas, like most places on our planet. In the case of the Argentine Republic, to give the nation its correct name, it is split into areas called provinces. In total, Argentina is split into 23 provinces. Each of these provinces have their own image, culture, and of course, name. These names derive from a variety of roots, from the nation's native past to its European settlers, though be prepared to hear me say San slash Santo an awful lot. Those Argentinian slash Spanish colonizers sure love their saints. So today we're looking into how the provinces of Argentina got their names. Let's start at the top of the nation with Argentina's northernmost province, Jujuy. From what I can gather, this province's name derives from the Inca who inhabited this land before European colonizers arrived. This name comes from a Quechua word which was a title given to the Inca rulers of this province. So it's a province named after the title of its former ruler. As we venture south, we arrive in the province of Solita. This is a province where there are actually a few theories as to where the name came from. One idea is that the name derives from a native tribe there called the Solitas, while another idea is that it means crag place in Quechua, perhaps meaning a craggy place, as in craggy rocks. Though another idea is that it means very beautiful in the Aymara language. This theory is popular as it gives the province a very positive name meaning, and it looks very beautiful there indeed. The next province of Formosa shares its name with its largest city, and both the city as well as the province have their name definitively deriving from Spanish, coming from the Spanish word for beautiful. Once again, because this part of the country is bathed in natural beauty. However, speakers of Spanish might be feeling a little bit confused right now, because Formosa isn't actually the Spanish word for beautiful, Hermosa is instead. Well, this word was spelt with an F instead of an H in Spanish's past, e.g. the time this province received this name. This isn't the only part of the world that bears this name, however. Noticeably, Taiwan bared this name in its past, specifically being called Ilha Formosa, meaning beautiful island. As we continue, we arrive in the province of Catamarca. This is another name of native origins, either Quechua or Aymala. The Quechua etymology has it meaning fortress on the slope, while the Aymala etymology has it meaning small town. Whichever is correct, it seems that this province was named after some kind of man-made construct. Tucuman sounds a little bit like the name of a toucan themed superhero, which by the way would be awesome, Marvel, drop me a DM or I'll take it to image, but it is of course the name of an Argentine province. As to where this name came from, well the popular idea is that it comes from the Quechua term of Yucaman, meaning place of origin of several rivers, due to multiple rivers meeting here, though there's also the belief that it comes from the word Tukma, meaning the end of things, as this region was once the Inca Empire's outer limit. Limit. Santiago del Estelo is of course a Spanish name, with Santiago meaning Saint James. Like I said, they love a saint. Del means of, so the name means Saint James of Estelo, with Estelos supposedly being a name for larger bodies of water that used to be here. This province, however, also shares its name with a city within it of the same name, which was actually the first city settled by the Spanish in the region that would become Argentina. The province of Chaco seems to get its name from a larger area of land that is a part of that goes into other nations too, the Gran Chaco. This is a sparsely populated wilderness that spreads into parts of Bolivia and Paraguay as well as Argentina. While not many humans live here, many animals do, and it's from these animals as to where the name is thought to come from, as Chaco is believed to mean hunting grounds in Quechua. Colientes is another province named after its largest city, 
with this city's name simply meaning currents in the Guarani language. I imagine this comes from the strong currents of the Panama River that runs through this city and the province. The province of Misiones is a small alcove of land in the nation's northeast. This name comes from the Spanish word for missions. This is because of the Jesuit missions that took place across this land in the 17th and 18th centuries. The province of La Rioja is unsurprisingly a name of Spanish creation. I say unsurprisingly because the nation of Spain itself also has a province of this exact same name. It seems this Argentine province slash the largest city within it were named directly after the Spanish one, with the Spanish province being named after the Rio Oya, a river that runs through it. The province of San Juan is once again Spanish and once again saintly in origins, with San Juan simply meaning Saint John in English. This is of course not the only San Juan on our globe. Puerto Rico's capital bears this name too. The province of Cordoba, like La Rioja, is too named after somewhere in Spain, that being the city of Cordoba in the nation's south. It received this name from one Jolonimo Luis de Cabela, a Spanish conquistador who came across this land and founded the Argentinian city of Cordoba, which the province grew around. Many of these provinces are named after cities within them, so apologies if I don't mention that outright in every case. Another name that appears all across the Spanish-speaking world is Santa Fe. There are Santa Fe's in Spain itself, as well as nations like Mexico, Panama, Honduras, Ecuador, Cuba, the USA, and even the Philippines. Argentina is no different. Santa Fe is the name of a province and its largest city in the nation of Argentina, and the name simply means holy faith, coming from religious roots once again. The province of Entre Rios is too Spanish, and once again we see the word of Rios meaning river. The Entre part before it however means between, as this province is nestled between a variety of rivers it seems. The province of San Luis is of course named after St. Louis, which means it technically has the same name as the popular city in the US state of Missouri. The real St. Louis that many places are named after was actually King Louis IX of France, who reigned from 1226 to 1270. He seems to have gone down better in the history books than a certain other French King Louis it seems. The Argentine province of Mendoza is named after someone, but in this case not a saint, which is a change of pace. The province is in instead named after Don Garcia Hortedo de Mendoza, who was actually the governor of Chile. This might seem odd, but in the past, the area of land named Chile that was ruled by the Spanish stretched into modern day Argentina too. Mendoza! The province of La Pampa is a lot like the province of Chaco, in the fact it is named after a larger area of land that spreads into other nations. The Pampas cover a large area of South America and comprise of sparsely populated lowlands. The name of Pampa comes from Quechuan roots and simply means plain, as these are the plains of South America. We then arrive at the province of Buenos Aires, which houses the nation's capital city of the same name. This province is not not only the nation's largest in size, but also in population. Of course, this province is named after the capital, so how did the city receive this name? This name is Spanish and means good air slash fair winds. Why it is named after this, however, there seems to be a few theories. The most popular theory is because the area where the old city was established was on swampland, which attracted mosquitoes and in turn, malaria, meaning the air was pretty bad, to say the least. Then, Years later when the city began to expand, ports were established where the air was good and not rife with bugs and disease. This bug-free atmosphere is believed to be the good airs that the capital is named after. As we venture further south down the nation, we arrive in the province of Nguyen. This province is named after a river that runs through it. As to how this river got its name, it seems to come from a Mapadongan word meaning drafty. Perhaps the winds on this river are quite irksome. Though a bonus fact, this province's name is also a palindrome. Well, if we ignore the accent on the second E that is. 
Anyway, anyone with a slight understanding of Spanish will probably be able to understand how the province of Rio Negro got its name. It of course means the Black River, and this Black River runs across this province, named most likely due to the darkness of its waters. The province of Chubut, however, has a name meaning quite the opposite of Rio Negro. This province comes from the Chubut River, with this river's name come from the Toholichi word of Chupat, which means transparent. This is because the waters of this river were seen as being remarkably clear, like I said, pretty darn different to the waters of the Black River. Deeper into the nation south, we arrive at the province of Santa Cruz, another one of the many Santa Cruzes on our planet, with this name meaning Holy Cross. Argentina's final province lies at the curved tip of South America. It has the cumbersome name of Tierra del Fuego, Antarctica and South Atlantic Islands, though it's often shortened to just Tierra del Fuego. The latter part of this name exists because this province includes the nation's islands in the South Atlantic and even the Antarctic claim. The Tierra del Fuego part of this name however means land or fire, which supposedly comes from the fires natives lit here in the past for war. Oomph. Argentina really is a land with a huge amount of diversity, from the plains of La Pampa, the bustling cities like Buenos Aires, to the freezing depths of Tierra del Fuego. It has huge diversity in its history too, from the various native tribes in the land to its Spanish settlers. And all of this diversity can be seen perfectly clearly in the names of its 23 provinces. Today's edition of Unfathomable Words the Internet Wants Patrick to Butcher, or whatever this channel is called these days, we are looking into the nation of Sweden. Like the rest of the world, Sweden is too split up into various different smaller areas. As to what these smaller divisions are called, I found a handful of names. Wikipedia produced to me the names of counties, regions, and provinces of Sweden. So what exactly are the difference between these things? Well, in regards to counties and regions, there doesn't seem to be too much of a difference at all. County and region seems to be just different names for the same areas of land, and it's these counties slash regions that are the administrative divisions of Sweden. The provinces of Sweden are more historic boundaries and don't serve any administrative function. It's the form of these divisions that we shall be looking into today, county slash regions, though for ease's sake I will just be calling them counties. Whether this be the correct decision is beyond me. If you happen to be watching from Sweden, let me know if these counties are more popular than the aforementioned provinces. Though nevertheless, as mentioned up top, this is going to be another string of names that I will most likely stumble over. But please do not let my inevitable mispronunciations of these names affect your image of this wonderful nation. Sweden is a really fascinating place, even just from my limited time in the land. And its 21 counties reflect everything this nation has to offer, from its cosmopolitan cities to its expansive wilderness. So today, let's find out how the counties of Sweden got their names. Let's kick things off in the south of the nation. Sweden's southernmost county is called Skåne and is home to one of the nation's most well-known cities, Malmo. This county is also known as its exonym of Scania. Skåne slash Scania and Scandinavia are believed to come from the same etymological root. It's thought that the whole of Scandinavia would have been named after this area because this landmass would have been the first landed in by ancient peoples as they sailed from northern Germany slash Denmark into this part of the world. As to where this name comes from though, it's thought to come from Germanic words meaning danger and island, as travelling here by sea in the past was a rather dangerous endeavour. And of course in the past people thought this land was a separate island, they didn't know it was actually connected to the rest of Europe. Sweden's next county is called Blekinge, the smallest county of Sweden by land area. This name's meaning is quite the opposite to the previous county's name. While Skåne is named after its dangerous waters, it seems that Blekinge is named after its more peaceful seas. The name is believed to come from Old Danish root and mean bay of still water or even meaning dead calm due to how hospitable the waters of this county are. Then we have the county of Halland on the nation's southwest coast. The the best I could dig up in regards to what this name means is that it means stony land, coming from old Scandinavian roots, I guess due to the stony geography of this county. 
The county of Klonabergi is named after a castle, hence the Berg part that we've seen so many Germanic place names. This castle is named after Klonabergi Castle, yeah, which means Klono Castle Castle. The former part of this castle's name means crown, so the full name means Crown Castle, a suitably royal name for something as royal as a castle. Kalmar County is made up of not only part of mainland Sweden, but the island of Orland too. This county is named after its largest city of of Kalamar, though as to how this city got its name we don't seem to be too sure. One theory is that comes from the Swedish word for cairn, with cairn being the name for a man-made pile of stones. We then arrive at the only county of Sweden that is completely disconnected from its mainland, that being Gotland. This is Sweden's largest island, though it is also the least populated county of the nation. Gotland is named after the Goths, not the musical genre slash star, but rather the Germanic tribe of the Goths. This is because many historians believe that the Goths actually originated from this island. The county of Jönköping is also named after its largest city. Initially, however, this city was just called Shopping, which means trading slash marketplace, as this settlement must have been established for trading reasons at first. As to why Jönö got attached to this name, well, I read it either comes from the name of another nearby settlement or the name of a nearby river. Vastula Gotaland has a name very similar to the aforementioned Gotland Island. The latter word in this name is another way of saying Gotland, perhaps a different tribal Goths came from here. The former word of Vastraya, however, is simply the Swedish word for Western. These are the Western Goth lands. From this name, I'm sure you'll be able to figure out what the next county's name means too. It is simply called Ostergotaland and is directly east of Vastragotaland. So, yeah, this county's name simply means Eastern Goth lands. Continuing upwards, we arrive at the county of Varmaland. While this county looks very pastoral, its name does not mean farmland, despite how similar it sounds to that English term. Varmland is instead believed to be named after a lake in the county, Valmelen. As to how this lake got its name, I couldn't tell you. It sounds and is spelled very similarly to the Swedish word for heat, so perhaps it has some sort of hot connotation. Ole Blue County is once again another county named after its largest city of Ole Blue. This city's name, however, is a compound of two words. The first part of this city's name means bank, as in the banks of a river, while the latter part of this name means bridge. So the name of this city derives from a bridge that must have spanned over the banks of a river. In turn, this city went on to name the entire county it is in. The name of the county of Södermanland is a lovely reminder of just how similar English and Swedish can be at times times it would seem. This name simply means a land of the southern men. It does look very similar to how one would say southern man lands in English. I suppose this county is relatively southern in the grand scheme of Sweden, so this name does make sense. If Södermanland means a land of the southern men in English, and we've already mentioned that Vastula means western, then I'm sure you can deduce what exactly Vastmanland means then. It simply means land of the western men. I imagine this is because this county is to the northwest of the nation. The county of Uppsala is once again named after the largest city within it, the city of Uppsala. The up part of this name does in fact directly relate to the word up in English it would seem. Uppsala is believed to mean things along the lines of upper halls or upper dwellings. This ultimately comes from an ancient temple that had high up dwellings that was once in this city a long time ago. We then arrive at the county of Stockholm, obviously named after the nation's capital of Stockholm, which of course lies within this county. Stockholm is a name we have covered already in a plethora of other videos, but why not cover it here again? Stockholm's name is comprised of the two words of Stock and Holm. The the latter part is more agreed upon. Home means island or inlet, and the county slash city has it in its name because the city of Stockholm is dotted across multiple small islands. As for the stock part of the name, that is up for a tad more debate. The most popular idea is that it means logs slash poles, coming from the Swedish word of stocker. As to why the city would be named after logs, we don't seem to be too sure. Ideas for the city being named after logs range from logs being used as markers across the city to logs being 
being used to bar ships entry and forcing them to pay tolls. The further north we go up the nation, the larger these counties become. The first of these larger northern counties is Dalarna. This county's name simply means the Dales. Dales are a geographic term for large undisrupted areas of nature, similar to valleys. What's interesting is that Dale is an incredibly popular term in British place names. So to see the word being used here in Sweden is yet another reminder of the similarities between the languages. Gävleborg County is once again named after its largest city. Well, kind of. The city is just called Gävle. It's safe to assume that the Borge part of the name relates to Berg once again and comes from Gävle Castle, a palace within the city. This city's name is thought to derive from the old Swedish word of Gavel, meaning riverbanks, initially given to the river that's in the city. So the county is named after a castle, which is named after a city, which is named after a river, which is named after its banks. Simple really. The county of Jamtland is named a lot like Gotland, in the fact it is named after the tribe who lived there. In this case, it was named after the Jumps, an indigenous group that once called this land their home. Thus the Norland's county name might make you raise an eyebrow. This name simply means Western Norland, with Norland meaning Northland. And while it is northern in Sweden, it's on the nation's east, not west. This is because Norland as a whole was once a much larger region of the world that crossed into Sweden and Finland. In the grand scheme of Norland, this would have in fact been its western side. One person's east is always another person's west. Then we have the county of Vasterbotten, which which means western bottom slash low, due to this being the lower land in the west of Norland. And finally we have the county of Norbotten, which simply means north bottom. The north part is pretty self-explanatory. It is the northernmost county in the whole of Sweden, with the bottom part once again referring to the lowness of these lands. While a lot of these county names might seem pretty scary to a non-native at first, it's surprising to see just how similar so many sound to their English counterparts. Perhaps Perhaps I shouldn't have been as scared about talking about Sweden's counties. 117 AD under the rule of one Emperor Trajan, the Roman Empire reached its greatest size. It spanned from the island of Great Britain, across the majority of mainland Europe, the entirety of the Mediterranean coast, its islands, the lands of North Africa, and even into parts of Asia. This three continent spanning empire was a juggernaut of the ancient world. And while this was its peak, meaning things would only go down from here, they of course didn't know that at the time. To them, the Pax Roman was in full of swing. Of course, while the empire had one emperor, he was not the only source of authority in the land. To make this empire easier to manage, it was split into smaller subdivisions, each with their own authority. These subdivisions were called provinces. There were two kinds of provinces, senatorial provinces and imperial provinces. The key difference between these two is how they were ruled. Senatorial provinces were ruled by former consuls who had annual terms, whereas imperial provinces were ruled by representative of the emperor himself, and they served indefinitely. Rome's provinces would fluctuate over the years, getting bigger and smaller and changing shape. So to make things easier, today we are focusing on the provinces of Rome during its peak in 117 AD. More specifically, the provinces I found on this map via Wikipedia. Cheers lads. At this peak, Rome was formed of 47 provinces. Of course, all these provinces had their own names. And the names and borders of these provinces have varying degrees of similarity with the names and borders on our modern maps too. Some names have barely changed slash not changed at all, while some names you won't find anywhere on our modern maps. And some names are even in places you might not really expect them. Anyway, as I said, we have 47 of these provinces to cover, so let's get into it and find out how the provinces of the Roman Empire got their names. We will be starting in the south of the Iberian Peninsula, or Hispania as it was known to the Romans, with the province of Baetica, and apologies about pronunciation in this video, my Latin isn't up to scratch. 
This province's name derives from the name of the river that runs through it, the Guadalquivir River, which was called in Latin Beatus. Why the Romans gave this river this name we don't seem to be too sure, but we aren't here to explain the river's name, we're here to explain the province's name. The province of Lustania corresponds roughly with modern day Portugal. The name comes from the tribe the Romans encountered here, the Lustuani. Spoiler alert, a lot of these provinces are going to be named after tribes slash people encountered there. The large the largest province in Hispania, however, was Terraconesis. It looks likely that this province was named after the ancient city in the land, Taraco, which is now the city of Talagona. This city might have potentially been named after someone by the name of Telecon the Ethiopian, who was supposedly a 7th century BC Egyptian pharaoh. Around the area that equates to modern southwest France, we have the province of Aquitania. This name has resonance today as the modern name for this region in southwest France is Aquitan deriving from the Roman name. Aquitania is thought to derive from the Latin words for water and land, meaning, well, waterland due to proximity to the coast perhaps. Modern southeast France to the Romans however was the province of Narbonesis. This was named after the city of Narbo founded in this land, which is now the city of Nabon. The ultimate origin of the city's name however is lost to history. Likewise, the province of Lognesis, which spans across modern France, is too named after a city which was established by the Romans, Lugdunum, which evolved into the modern city of Lyon. Lugdunum is believed to mean something like four Fortress of Lugus, a Celtic god who was worshipped here. Over the years, this name naturally shifted into Lyon. The Roman province of Belgica in northwest France was named after a tribe which the Romans fought and eventually conquered here. And if you couldn't tell, it was this province's name that was adapted into the name of the modern nation of Belgium, which resides in the land this province covered too. Across the water, however, we arrive in the Roman province of Britannia. Despite Britain slash Great Britain being the name for this island as a whole, back then this name related to just the land we now create with England and Wales. Caledonia, or Scotland as we now call it, would forever remain free of Roman rule. Britannia is believed to ultimately come from a group of people who were living in the land, the Britanni, meaning painted people, painted due to either wearing battle paints all over their bodies or because they were tattooed. The name of these people were adapted into the name for this land of Pretonike in Greek, which was then adapted into Britannia by the Romans. This might seem like a stretch at first, but E was the way in which Romans named places, and it was common to change P's into B's when translating from Greek to Latin. Germania appears in two Roman province names, Germania Inferior and Germania Superior. Germania once again comes from a tribe who the Romans encountered here, the Germani, which might have meant people of the forest. This of course gave us the name Germany for the country here today, at least in English. The superior and inferior in these names relate to their respective sizes. Around the border region of modern day France and Italy, the Roman Empire had three of its smallest provinces. From north to south, these were Alps Pennine, Alps Cote, and Alps Maritime. The former part of these three names relate to the Alps Mountains, of course, which in Latin had that additional E in their name. Alps is thought to derive from either the Latin words for high or white, because they were rather high up and covered in white snow. I can't quite figure out where exactly the latter parts of these names derive from exactly but it seems like they've survived on as names for mountain ranges within the Alps. Though the reason this land was split into three tiny provinces was simply because of how difficult it was to navigate around these mountains. The Roman province of Aretia equates pretty much with modern day Switzerland, though their names aren't similar at all. This province was once again named after the people the Romans encountered here, the Ratian people, also known as the Relati people. The province of Noricum sits where a lot of modern Austria sits today. Interestingly, we don't seem to be entirely sure where this name comes from. This is some pretty ancient history you must remember, so knowing as much as we already know is incredible. Wiktionary claims that it might come from a Proto-Indo-European word meaning vessel, which relates to the Welsh word valley. It's hard to make a conclusive decision with this one. We then arrive at that large boot-shaped peninsula where this whole empire originated from. This province was called Italia, and this name is said to come from the Vitali tribe who resided in the south of this peninsula, with their name believed to come from the Latin word for calf, as in baby cow. So the name kind of means the land of baby cow. Of course, 
when Western Rome came crumbling down, this name stuck around, with the country that took this province's place still being called Italia in its native language, though English speakers like myself call it Italy. The islands of Corsica and Sardinia, which now belong to France and Italy respectively, were a singular province under Roman rule, simply called Corsica et Sardinia, with et meaning and, obviously. The name Corsica comes from the Greek Corsis, which is of unknown origin, and the name Sardinia is thought to come from the Greek Sardo, which is thought to be, you guessed it, the name of the people who once lived here. The island of Sicily, as we call it today, was just one province, however, with the slightly different name of Cilia. This island slash province is once again named after its residents, the Sicalia. Back onto the mainland and we arrive at our next set of superior and inferior provinces, Pannonia Superior and Pannonia Inferior. These provinces equate with modern day Hungary and Austria and some other nations. Once again, these regions are named after tribes here, the Pannoi people. We do, thankfully, however, have a bit more information on their name's meaning. It's thought to mean things like swamp or water, relating to where they live. Dalmatia is still the name of a region of modern Croatia. However, during the Roman Empire, this name encompassed a lot more land. This land was named after the Dalmatia people, with their name believed to mean shepherd. The province of Dacia is pretty much the nation of Romania today, with that modern name greatly reflecting the empire's rule of this land in the past. Well before the Romans settled here, the Daci people did instead, with their name leading to the creation of the name Dacia. If you hadn't guessed by now, a lot of the origins of these tribes slash people names remain unclear to us. So while I can say these provinces are named after these tribes, I can't expand and explain how these tribes got their names every time I'm afraid. Mosia Superior and Mosia Inferior cover a lot of what makes up the modern Northern Balkans. Once again, the latter part of these names relate to the sizes of the provinces. The people who lived in this land were the Mosi, which is of course where this name came from. Regnum Bospori lies in the north of the Black Sea, in land now occupied by Russia and Ukraine, and wasn't actually a province. Instead, it was a client kingdom, which meant they had an alliance with the Roman Empire, but were free to do their own thing, to an extent. We shall cover this name here, because let's be honest, when am I ever going to have a chance to talk about Regnum Bospori ever again? Regnum is simply the Latin word for kingdom, and Bospori comes from an ancient name for the Kirk Strait, the Cimmerian Bosporus. Where that name comes from, however, we don't seem to know. Heading south of the Black Sea, we have the province of Thracia, which resides in parts of modern day Turkey, Bulgaria and Greece. Thracia comes from the Thracians, however their name origin is unknown. South of here we have the province of Macedonia. This province lies in parts of modern Greece, Albania, Bulgaria and of course North Macedonia. This area is once again named after the Macedonians, the people who live there, and their name is thought to mean things like long or tall so the name is thought to mean something like the land of the tall ones. The Roman province of Epirus is primarily made up of an area of modern Greece with a little bit of Albania in there too. It simply means something like mainland, I guess in relation to the Greek islands. The Roman province that made up southern Greece was called Archaea. This once again comes from a tribe, the Achaeans. What's noteworthy is that Greek writer Homer used this term a lot to refer to all Greeks in his writings at times. The province of Bithynia et Pontus ran along the north of what we now call Turkey. Bithynia comes from the tribe of the Bithyni, and Pontus comes from the ancient Greek name of the Black Sea, Pontos. The province that sits on the western end of modern Turkey has an interesting name name, as it's called Asia. The name Asia is thought to come from the Akkadian Asu, meaning to go out slash rise, in relation to the sun rising from this direction. Of course, the name Asia would go on to mean the entirety of the continent to the east of Rome slash Europe, with the land Turkey sits on becoming known as Little Asia, aka Asia Minor. Central modern Turkey was the province of Galatia. This province was named after Gauls. Gauls initially came from Western Europe, so it's impressive how far they traveled to reside here. The province of Lycia et Pamphylia lies in southern modern Turkey. Lycia's origins is unknown, though it may relate to the Greek word for wolves, Lycos. The name Pamphylia on the other hand doesn't relate to one specific tribe, but celebrates the variety of people who lived here, as the name literally means the 
place of all races. Annoyingly, however, the province of Cilia in South Turkey seems to have a name of unknown origins. All we know is that it's the Latinized form of its Greek name, Kilikia. The island nation we now refer to as Cyprus in the past was the Roman province of Cyprus, with the exact same name. This name relates directly to the Cypress trees that grew on the island. Northwest Turkey was home to the province of Cappadocia. One theory on this name is that supposedly means the land of beautiful horses. I guess they had pretty ponies here. The province of Armenia is where the modern nation of Armenia is today, along with some other land too. How the name Armenia came about however, we don't seem to be too sure. We have theories relating to kingdoms in the land to it coming from a nearby mountain. The province of Assyria doesn't lie where the modern nation of Syria does, instead it lies within part of modern Iraq. This name is believed to come from the name Ashur, which belonged to a city and a god here. Mesopotamia is seen as this area where civilization began, and while that is the case, the name wasn't used at that time, being coined by the Greeks and Romans. It means land between two rivers, relating to the Tigris and Euphrates that allowed life to flourish here. We then arrive at the province of just Syria, no A or extra S here. This province is much much more in line with the modern nation of Syria, and its name relates to that aforementioned Assyria too. Why both these parts of the world had the same name is probably a video for another time however. Further south we have the province of Udea. Of course I and J made similar sounds in the past. This province is where the nation of Israel and its region of Judea now sits. This name comes from Judah, the leader of the tribe of Judah, and a pretty important figure in this area to say the least. The small section of the Arabian Peninsula Rome held on to had the name Arabia Petraria. That latter word means rocky place, and Arabia of course comes from the Arab people who lived here. The province of Egyptus was the second most valuable province to the empire, just behind Italia itself. This resides pretty much where modern Egypt does today, and that modern name comes from this name too. This name comes from a temple in the city of Memphis in Egypt, which was in honour of the god Tar. As we move across North Africa, we arrive in the the province of Serankia et Krita, which relates to land in Africa itself, but also to the now Greek island of Crete. It seems that the first of these names come from the ancient city of Cyrene, and the name Krita is thought to possibly relate to people living there. Of course, the name would eventually become Crete as it is today. The Roman province of Africa, which resides across land in North Africa, much like Asia, went on to name the entire continent it now sits on. We don't know where the word Africa comes from, but but one idea is that it may derive from the Arabic afar, meaning dust slash earth, due to the climate and land here. The last two provinces share the word Marentia in their names. This name relates to the region of Maghreb, a name for northwest Africa as a whole. This comes from Arabic and means place of the setting sun, as it's in the west. The two provinces with Morentania in their name are called Morentania Caesarensis and Morentania Tigatana. The latter parts of these names relate to the important cities within them, which are now the cities of Churchill in Algeria and Tangier in Morocco respectively. And that is how every province of the Roman Empire in 117 AD anyway got its name and I must admit, despite how different the Roman Empire may have been to our modern world, it's shocking to see how little some of the names have changed over thousands of years. If you were somehow transported to ancient Rome, while everything might seem completely foreign, at least many of the place names would still be familiar.